Good evening, everyone. I would like to call to order the meeting of the Bo Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday. Oh, it's July. Yes. Yeah, what is it? July 12th. We will rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Nathan Gover and James Jester, Jr., Boy Scouts from Troop 475 in Parkville. We'll remain standing for a moment of silent meditation in memory of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Gentlemen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The first item for our agenda tonight is uh, is our agenda. Uh, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda, Dr. Dance? There are none. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much. Our next agenda item is a selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available in the, to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled meeting to 10. Each speaker is allotted three minutes to discuss his or her issue. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. If fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. The first speaker is Cynthia Boyd. Second is Gerald Malik. Number three is Bosch Ferron. Number four is Faisal Rondawa. Number five. five is Syed Navid Ahmed. Six. Number six, Marion Moore. Seven. Number seven, Mohammed Jamil. Eight. Number eight, Tyre Jones. Nine. Number nine is David Green. And number last is Hazel Jones. All of them? <coughs> Good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> moving on through our agenda, the next item is our superintendent's report. And with, for that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, three very quick uh, announcements from uh, the superintendent's report. First, I want to just say a special welcome to Aislin Bratt, um, our new student member of the board. Can we help uh, welcome her um, as a student member? <laughs> Aislinn is entering her senior year at Towson High School uh, this year, and she was selected from her peers. Uh, this was the first year where the student member of the board was selected from his or her peers. So congratulations to you, Aislinn. I was excited to be at her swearing-in uh, ceremony with the, at the clerk's office last week. I hope everyone is enjoying his or her summer. Uh, there's a lot of work that's happening right now in Baltimore County Public Schools, which includes curriculum writing, which was kicked off yesterday at Newtown High School, and curriculum writing um, that's happening. Or I should say professional development sessions that are happening all around the county. Um, this involves our curriculum writing, over 340 educators who are updating our curriculum and writing it to make sure that our students are uh, getting 21st century instruction in their classes when we begin in August. On the mornings of July 13th and July 19th, the workshops will be open to invited guests, including members of the board, the superintendent's cabinet, ATM, which is our academic team meeting, and community groups, citizens, and advisory council. So please join us there. Last but not least, tonight the board will be getting the independent year two evaluation of STAT by Johns Hopkins University. We're excited to continue our partnership with Hopkins. My staff and I have reviewed the report. I know I have several questions for myself um, and for staff from the report, and we will be submitting a formal response to the curriculum committee at its August meeting. Uh, but the summer professional development opportunity 
opportunities that we have happening all throughout the county is really dealing with adjusting our curriculum and instruction to make sure that sc schools, whether they're lighthouse schools or non-lighthouse schools, are getting that 21st century opportunity for our students organized by the Department of Organizational Development. As we look at the calendar, recognizing that school will be opening in a matter of a few short weeks, we want everyone to continue having a great remainder of the summer. Um, and to all of our administrative appointments who are here tonight along with your families, we're excited for you to welcome you to our team and to welcome you to new positions throughout the team. Um, this is the month, of course, we have a lot of administrative appointments and we're really excited about the new crop of leaders within our school system. So with that, that, that ends the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, our next agenda item is the chair's report, and I just have some brief comments for the evening. Uh, I also would like to begin uh, by welcoming our SMOB to the board. Uh, you know, it's very important that uh, the voice and perspective of our students are heard to the board so that we are able to make uh, informed decisions that help uh, our most important partner in BCPS, and that is our students. And in recent years, we've been fortunate enough to have some very dynamic <coughs> student representatives, and I'm very confident that Aislinn will continue their legacy in her time here with the board. So again, I'm very happy and excited to have her with us. Um, although many of us are enjoying summer, summer activities, as Dr. Dance mentioned, there's a lot of work taking place during the system, um, during the summer months. <coughs> And I was pleased to bring Thank greetings uh, to the teachers and administrators that are working on curriculum development at Newtown High School this week. Our system truly benefits by having educators that know our students and their needs develop curriculums, uh, curriculum for our, our classes. Uh, one of the concerns that reaches the board that, uh, from our community is that outside entities have will dictate uh, uh, how and what teachers uh, teach in the classrooms. And I believe it is extremely important that those in our system that have, have control over how and what is taught in our classroom. So it's very pleasing to see those 300 uh, teachers do their work uh, at Newtown this week. Um, the Board of Education has uh, its annual retreat scheduled for July 23rd. We have a very full agenda for the day and hope to use the time productively to refocus our efforts and move toward becoming a more effective and efficient board. Uh, included in our discussions uh, will be a review of the changes to the heat policy that, uh, and the various options that are being suggested by our policy review committee. Um, in recent weeks, uh, the community has also raised some concern about discipline issues in some of our school and the board will be working with the superintendent and staff to gain a better understanding of this issue as we uh, and and also to move the system forward um, discipline is a topic that will be also touched on during the retreat so with that those are all my com uh, comments and I thank you for your attention our next uh, section of uh, the meeting tonight is our public comment uh, this is one of the opportunities we provide to hear views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens and will take your comments into consideration, even though it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues which are raised. When appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public comment and input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. I would like to remind the public the inappropriate personnel, personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe our timer, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. And we'll start off our public comment uh, section of the meeting with our advisory and stakeholder group input. And the first, uh, to sign up, or first speaker for the evening, is from our Baltimore County Student Council, uh, Jordan Wilson. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, 
My name is Jordan Wilson and I am the Baltimore County Student Council's president for the 2016-2017 school year. Uh, I've been a part of BCSC for the past four years and this organization has really made me who I am today. Um, I'm very excited to be able to give back to uh, all the students in Baltimore County and serve as their president for next year. Uh, about a month ago, the other officers are New Smob Aislin and I actually chose our executive board for next year. And the group that we selected is very diverse in age, region, ethnicity, and background. And I really think that it's going to be one of our strongest executive boards ever. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, I look forward doing, to uh, continuing our incredible partnership with the Board of Ed and with Dr. Dance. Um, as soon as our calendar is finalized, we will make it to, available to Ms. Decker. And you guys are always welcome to uh, attend any of our events. We really appreciate when you do. Um, your support is fundamental to our organization. And uh, we can't wait to grow BCPS together. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. And Ms. Wilson, you attend Hereford, is that correct? Hereford High School? Okay. All right, we look forward to seeing you uh, more often. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from Tabco, John Redmond Palmer. Good evening, Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. Um, I am John Redmond Palmer. I'm the Vice President, and Abby is not able to make it today, so I'm bringing her remarks for her. We're a little more than a month away from the start of the school year for teachers. We at TABCO are planning for the new school year in BCPS. We are pleased to be working with the school system on many projects and initiatives. Most of these items are not new initiatives, but are continuations of work we have done together to strengthen our schools and provide the best education possible for our students. We are really pleased to be working on the new initiative surrounding community schools. We feel this is the perfect opportunity to not only engage our students, but to engage our parents and community to bring a better school experience for all. We are looking forward to working with the system to make sure that we get this work done correctly. We are also addressing the surrounding uh, the regulations being proposed for the new ESSA law, uh, Every Student Succeeds Act, which has replaced new, new Child Left Behind, mm -hmm. and the implications of our school system, students, and employees. We must make sure this time the law is implemented in a way that supports sc school improvement and doesn't create unnecessary roadblocks for students' education. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your summer. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Megan Stewart Sicking. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Yes, you got okay. it this time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman McDaniels, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and board members, it is a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, I've been here several times in the past year, but this time formally as the new chair of the CCAC. So uh, I am pleased to be here tonight in that capacity and look forward to seeing you more this year. I also wanted to let you know that we, um, I do have a co-chair, Hope Meisinger, who you've also met, uh, and two vice chairs, as well as two former chairs who will continue on our executive board. So we are full of, um, of well-qualified and dedicated people. So you will see several different people here before you over this next school year, all identifying themselves as members of the CCAC Executive Board, and we all look forward to working together collaboratively. I have two comments about uh, a couple of items on tonight's agenda, uh, both under L, New Business Contract Awards. Uh, briefly, item five, Special Education IEP Software Management System, uh, which will be used by all special education teachers to manage and monitor documentation. Uh, the amount of paperwork per student is remarkable and I can leave it at that. I'm not sure how they manage all of it. I can barely manage my folders for my two children. Uh, so we support anything that helps teachers and administrators manage documents more easily. Uh, and also item six, teaching resource for English language arts. As you well know, foundational reading skills, struggling readers, and dyslexia have been major topics of conversation this past year at board meetings, at two separate CCAC meetings, and also at the most recent curriculum committee meeting. In addition to supporting the expansion of the iReady system through this contract modification, I also want to commend the Office of Special Education for starting the collaboration with English language arts to address the needs of struggling readers. We are excited about collaboration between special educators and reading specialists, and that that collaborative plan includes teacher training to build expertise. Uh, 
All teachers need this knowledge base to understand what research now tells us about the process of reading and must be able to teach to a variety of struggling readers. In my view, there's simply no reason for any student to struggle or experience continued frustration when there's an evidence-based, readily available solution. The iReady system specifically identifies student needs with an adaptive diagnostic and will help teachers make appropriate instructional decisions based on actual data. While we always wish that more can happen faster, we commend the Offices of Special Education and English Language Arts for this collaboration. This will continue to be a topic of conversation for us throughout the next year, and we support the contract expansion on the agenda tonight. While being hopeful and excited about the continued good work by the Office of Special Education to address foundational reading skills. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, Leslie Weber. Good evening, I'm Leslie Weber, Communications Chair of PTA Council, speaking tonight on behalf of our President Emory Young. PTA Council has spoken at previous meetings in support of the Safety and Technology Committee due to concerns for students' cyber safety, privacy, and health. Having read Johns Hopkins' most recent STAT report, we're concerned about a number of safety issues. The report noted that a large number of students, especially in grade six, frequently use their devices to play video games, listen to music, watch YouTube videos, surf the web, text, and take pictures of themselves or other students. It was reported that tech-savvy students were able to break through firewalls to access off-limits websites. All of this violates policy and rule 6202, technology acceptable use policy for students, mandating that BCPS technology and networks be used for educational purposes only. Under the rule, students are held responsible for appropriate online behavior. Because the improper use of the devices is so widespread, how can the policy and rule be enforced? We urge the school system to take steps to eliminate or minimize these inappropriate, even dangerous practices in BCPS classrooms. Another facet of policy in Rule 6202 covers student photos taken during school activities, which BCPS may use to enhance its publications and communications. This includes sharing children's images via Twitter. Here's the problem. If parents don't want their children's images to be tweeted, they have to opt out of having their children's pictures included in the school yearbook. We feel this is an unfair choice, since the first is a privacy and safety issue, and the second excludes children from an important school publication with personal significance. PTA Council is aware that the Board of Ed's Policy Review Committee recently discussed revising Rule 6202's opt-out form. We believe that a more nuanced opt-out form is needed and should be revised as soon as possible, even mid-year if necessary. We know that principals have been asked to provide feedback, but parents must weigh in too. A related issue requiring parental input is Rule 6202's provision that parents are exclusively responsible for monitoring their child's use of the internet when the BCPS ne network is accessed outside of school. As earlier noted, the rule also holds students responsible for appropriate digital behavior. In both cases, it appears that the school system is absolving itself from responsibility for the appropriate use of BCPS provided devices. Feedback is clearly needed to better define parents, students, and the school system's roles in conducting, monitoring, and enforcing proper digital behavior. PTA Council requests that parental input be solicited on both the opt-out form and on these rule provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, uh, Ms. Julie miller breitz Good evening, President McDaniels, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. Later tonight, you'll be hearing about the proposed changes to the Board of Education Policy 6401 that governs instruction of gifted and talented students in the county. The GTCAC has worked with BCPS staff over the last two years on this policy, but we believe that many of our key concerns need to be more fully addressed. It is our opinion that Policy 6401 in its current draft state is not in compliance with state law. 
Policy 6401 must follow the legal requirements set out in the Annotated Code of Maryland, Education Article Section 5401 and Sections 8201 through 8204 and the Code of Maryland Regulations or COMAR 13A.04.07. The ana analysis document claims that these legal requirements are met. However, if you read the related sections of the Annotated Code and COMAR and compare the language in the governing documents to that proposed for Policy 6401, you might describe them as two ships passing in the night, as did a lawyer friend of mine who read through everything. Policy 6401 does not comport with state statutes and regulation. Gifted and talented is a defined term in Education Article Section 8201. Education Article 5401D5 states that county boards must provide comprehensive master plans regarding the performance of gifted and talented students as defined in 8201. COMAR mandates that local school systems shall establish a process for identifying gifted and talented students as they are defined in 8201 and provide programs and services to gifted and talented students. The word shall means must. It is mandatory. However, the proposed revised policy 6401, it does not use the term gifted and talented at all. It does not use the word identification at all. It makes a vague reference to providing the board with data regarding the advanced academic program. BCPS argues that the term advanced academics is the current term of art for BCPS's gifted and talented program. We would argue that Maryland has, by statute and regulation, already determined that the term of art in Maryland is gifted and talented. The word gifted has been around for a long time, and it means something. It describes student with a specific set of academic, social, and emotional traits. The Maryland legislature has chosen to use it. Any change in terminology is up to the legislature and not the local school board. BCPS needs to align their policies to the statutes and regulation, otherwise the very population that Maryland law seeks to speaks to simply does not exist in Baltimore County. How can BCPS do anything set out in statute and regulation for the gifted and talented population when that term does not exist in the very policy that serves this group of students? How is BCPS following the regulation to identify gifted and talented students when neither the term gifted or talented nor the word identify is used in this policy? How can BCPS deliver the comprehensive plan required of them by 5401 when they don't use GT terminology? What group are they going to report on? Policy 6401 needs to align with the language Thank you, Ms. Breitz. Our first speaker in the public comment section is Cynthia Boyd. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Good evening. The PTA has national standards for family school partnerships, and a key tenant of this is a stakeholder survey that includes a place for open-ended comment. I hope that future opportunities for family engagement in BCPS will include methods that allow for meaningful substantive communication about specifics, what is working well and what is not. It may come as a surprise to you, but it's actually really hard to come and speak publicly at these meetings. And I believe there are many parents who would like more ways to communicate constructively. Last fall, BCPS had students take up the Speak Up survey by project tomorrow during the school day. <coughs> parents could also do a parent survey. The flyer said the results were going to be used to inform the STAT initiative. This survey is run by a national nonprofit that receives most of the funding for this survey from for-profit ed tech companies, including Dreambox and BrainPop. For most of the questions, the only way to answer them would support further expansion of technology in classrooms. One question given to young students asked students to design their dream school, but then only gave them 24 possible choices about more technology, videos, and educational video games. This isn't a fair question. There are many children who would like more art, more recess, more music, or smaller class sizes, but there was no way for them to say so. The survey for parents was similar. The BCPS annual stakeholder survey this year included questions about personalized learning for parents. The way the questions were phrased were problematic, and again, there was no opportunity to provide open-ended or constructive feedback. In the slides regarding the stat evaluation we will hear about later tonight is the bullet point that parents and students had very strong and positive reactions. This statement surprised me, because if you read the full report, you'll see that the questions were Likert-scale responses, or strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree, 
agree, disagree, agree, or strongly agree, to statements such as, quote, access to digital content supports customized and personalized learning. These are leading questions. Even so, when you look at the actual results, for example, 35% of Lighthouse Middle School parents disagreed or strongly disagreed with the statement that, quote, personalized learning provides teachers with the opportunity to meet student needs, end quote. Only 17% of Lighthouse Middle School parents strongly agreed with the statement. This does not sound very strong and positive. I hope that going forward, BCPS will provide more opportunities for meaningful communication to inform decision making about STAT as well as other issues. BCPS staff held two meetings with parents about BCPS 1 this spring. I thought the one I attended was very well done and I believe the staff was genuinely interested in what parents had to say. I haven't yet heard how the points will affect BCP 1 next year, but I am hopeful that the conversation will have real impact. I mention this as an example of the type of input that I hope BCPS pursues more often and that strategies are enlisted to ensure more families can participate. Survey questions that only have answer choices that support what technology want to hear will not constructively inform the staff initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Our next speaker is Janal Malik. <coughs> Good afternoon. Chairman Hello. McDaniel, Vice Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. My name is Janaid Malik, and I became a graduate of Western Tech and BCPS this past June. During my time as a BCPS student, I was blessed with many amazing opportunities and experiences. From the dedicated teachers to an environment that encourages excellence, BCPS has helped me grow as both a student <coughs> and an individual. For that, I want to thank this board and all the staff that have made this possible. However, as with any organization, there are always issues. Among them was the decision I spoke about in May, the decision to not allow teachers from Western Tech and Woodlawn from attending graduation. That decision was one that ran counter to values of equity and inclusion. Today, I am here to speak about another issue that raises many of the same concerns, the issue of acknowledging the Muslim holidays of Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. I am here as the former president of the Muslim Student Association at Western Tech and as the brother of two current students. As for, Mus for Muslims, the celebrations of Eid, the Muslim holiday, is supposed to be a day of family, a day of happiness, and a day, yes, of gift giving. However, the failure to recognize these holidays has instead replaced happiness with sadness, joy with tension, and peace with conflict, as Muslim students struggle to balance their identity as Muslims and as with their role as students. This conflict that Muslim students feel on the religious holiday is one that, thankfully, Christian and Jewish students do not have to feel. For that reason, on Rosh Hashanah and Christmas, days of celebration are true days of celebration. For over a decade, the Muslim community, Muslim students, teachers, and parents have asked this board to recognize Eid as a Muslim holiday and make it a true day of celebration. In the same way that the Jewish and Christian holidays have been given, have been recognized, BCPS should recognize the Muslim holidays. It will go to the same goal of, of allowing each student to feel valued and accepted within BCPS. I want to be clear, I would not be here if I did not believe that this board would act in the interests and the values that guide BCPS policy, inclusion, diversity, equity, the values that this board should be running its policies on. However, every year that goes by without action, without positive action on this issue is a year where Muslim students begin to question whether BCPS truly values and wants to appreciate every student, regardless of their background. I hope and I pray that a day will come when I will not have to explain to my younger brother why it is that BCPS can espouse equality and not recognize the Muslim holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bash Faron. Good evening to all. Good evening. I'm really disappointed that the school system did not really debate and hopefully approve the closure on the Muslim holidays. I want to remind the board members, especially the new ones, the young one, welcome, that the issue is about equality. Equality with the other two non coma religious holidays that the school system has closed for the past 20 years without data. 
And in those 12 years that I have been keen and active almost in every board of education, I myself and many in the community, like the young man before me, addressed every question the board had about closing on the Muslim holidays. <coughs> there is no comment by any board member or others that we have not really addressed. And we came in large numbers. 2004, huge numbers filled this room and the hall outside. 2005, the same. Then the community really lost faith in the Board of Education for several years. This last year in this special meeting, this room was really filled, plus the hallway outside, and 20 of our members spoke up. After that, Ms. Romaine Williams did not allow anybody to speak, which I understand and I appreciate. But nonetheless, we filled the room. No one in that special meeting objected that the school system would treat Muslim holidays equal to the other two non-Koma religious holidays. So with that, I really don't know, as an activist in this board, when the school system is going to address the issue. I respectfully ask you, honorable board members, I ask you, actually, I thank you for volunteerism in your job. I know you're not paid. You're doing it out of honesty. I ask you to address it in your retreat, and to put it on the agenda in the August meeting. I ask you to make a motion to close the schools on Eid al-Fatr and Eid al-Adha, equal to the closure on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. 20 years of injustice is long time enough. The time is now. And if we really don't do that, the community loses faith and would have really issues with, with the system. You know, we are all about inclusion. I'm asking you to include us as you included our cousins and nieces. Thank you again. I have three seconds, two, <laughs> one. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Farron. Our next speaker is Faisal Ranhawa. Would you pronounce your last name for me, please? Yeah, I just spell it right, sir. It's Ranhawa. Thank you. And um, anyway, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is, uh, so you mentioned Faisal Ranhawa. I'm a healthcare provider by profession, and uh, I'll be very brief, and uh, would like to say that I'm uh, one of the four brothers and sisters and siblings, being the eldest one, and two of my siblings who were productive of here in Baltimore County went to Baltimore uh, Public Schools. That is Franklin High and Franklin Middle in Ricestown, Maryland. And I've been watching as a silent spectator from far away this issue which Dr. Ferron and my other colleagues raised regarding uh, Muslim uh, religious holidays. And I personally feel my brothers and sisters and many of my cousins, uh, for them going to school, especially on the Muslim religious holiday, is kind of unfair and uh, does not make any sense. Now, many of my members in the community, peers, and especially elderly, have uh, also expressed uh, their struggle with this issue. It's a matter of justice and equality, especially considering the growing uh, uh, Muslim population in North America. Uh, I would say it's a proof in the pudding and now it's my nephew and nieces and the new generation. I personally feel their future is at stake. It's a message of equality and personally feel if the uh, members of the uh, Board of Education consider this issue and come to a resolute conclusion about this issue would be really great. And once again, I would like to thank everybody uh, Mr. President, 
the members of the board and Dr. Dan's uh, for considering this issue in all fairness and uh, coming to a conclusion about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Syed Nabid Ahmad. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. All right. Um, first of all, I'd like to commend and thank the board for the wonderful work they have done over the years, over the months. Um, I'm not sure if any of you recognize me, but I've attended these meetings for about like the past year or two so. Uh, mainly due to some of our leadership we have here in the crowd with us and a lot of the familiar faces. Um, first of all, I'm just pretty much piggybacking from a lot of the topics that have been already addressed by the public comment. And first, I really want to give a, a huge shout out to the first speaker. And I really truly do agree with her that we need a lot of more um, uh, ways to uh, voice our concerns and opinions uh, in addition to just these uh, meetings, uh, forums, um, on email, I would, even, I would even say on Facebook, you know, other ways to um, uh, get to folks that they could fill out uh, their suggestions and their <clears throat> I'm sorry, and their feedback so that, you know, we could help uh, improve the system to the best of our ability because, you know, the way that, you know, the board will see it respectively is a, is a much different angle than the uh, community, than parents, than students, and so forth and so on. Um, and like uh, some of the speakers have already talked about before me, uh, another, another huge issue is about the closure uh, for the religious holidays, and not just for the Muslim faith, but even for the Hindu faith and several other uh, major religions uh, because, um, like some of the speakers have said before me, and I'm sure you may have heard uh, in the past few uh, meetings as well over the months and years, it is truly unfair that, um, you know, when, when it comes time for uh, the respective holidays, instead of celebrating those holidays, ins instead of uh, receiving and giving gifts, uh, kids have to take a double check and think about the assignment that's due tomorrow or some test coming up or what have you. And speaking from, uh, speaking from experience, I also, I also attended Western Tech, um, as the um, second speaker um, uh, talked about. And I remember one, one time, specifically in ninth grade, I had an exam or something on the on my on my holiday um, day, and I I had to skip my festivities just for the sake of uh, that um, test. And looking back now, you know, yeah, sure, it went well and, and all of that. But at that time, at that moment, uh, I had that fear in me that I might fail the class, I might not do well for that for that quarter or what or what have you. And therefore, I took that decision to skip out on the holiday festivities, which my which my family told me that I missed out a lot on, um, for the sake of um, you know just uh, you know pleasing uh, you know overall goal of doing well in school. Um, so again, like, it, it's just, um, it's just really, uh, uh, especially for like the, like the upcoming generation, especially the time they're living in right now, with so much bigotry going on, so much hatred going on, I think it's about time that every single one of us, you know, you all, people behind me, everybody in this room, kind of come together, you know, realize, you know, come together with the similarities, you know, take away the differences and like stand together because that's all we need right now. We need everybody, hands together, on the same page, helping each other out, having, having each other's backs, and doing whatever we can to face off and fend off all the negativity and all the, um, you know, unnecessary, um, drama that's going on in the country right now. So I think this is one way that we can do it to help each other out, to help out everyone, to make it a better world and better society and better community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. First, I would like to give a shout out to my mom. Today is her birthday. She turned 79. And um, I dedicate the speech to her because she uh, was a teacher for over 30 years for Baltimore City Public Schools. My name is Marion Moore, representing my consulting business, Compete with Purpose, LLC. I am from Baltimore City, worked for your school system for seven years as an educator, and my son attended your elementary schools for four years. In fact, many of your county rep, uh, residents are Baltimore City natives. Some chose this county as a safe place to raise their children, a promising place for educational opportunities, or a progressive place to seek employment. Also, based on historical trends, you will, ha uh, sorry, you will have African American teachers, principals, parents, and students from Baltimore City transferring to your school system. So it is vital for you to team up with people of diverse backgrounds who can help you resolve some of your issues related to culture and climate. 
So, Dr. Dance, can we both demonstrate our leadership in a positive and transformative way? Can we team up like all stars and collaborate on an economic plan I've shared with the board that would aggressively address your school system's financial needs and desires? I've been promoting this personalized project, excuse me, project since 2013 based on my business education teaching experience at Carver Center, which is one of the, your most globally competitive high schools throughout the county. My competitive advantage is that I've played with Team BCPS from the inside educationally and from the outside politically for a combined 10 years. So I've devised an innovative game plan that would make your strengths a threat to the status quo in education and transform your annual budget into unlimited economic opportunities. More importantly, I believe that BCPS could be the model school system that would show the world Education is and will be the government's new economic stimulus package with customized career development initiatives, financial and civil literacy programs while strategically integrating technology in the classroom. So I have my economic plans proposal, copyright certificate, and my contact information. I would love the opportunity to present to you, the board, the county executive, Department of Economic Development, a preview of my economic plan. I would like to end my legal case with your school system if given this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our next speaker is Mohammed Jamil. Peace and good evening. Good evening. Uh, everyone. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, meeting Congressman Clarence Long. That goes to tell you what my age is. <laughs> uh, he mentioned, he said that it takes a strong leader to set aside the biases when making policies. Failure to do so will create an inherent inequality or discrimination within that policy. A few years ago, a seminar was held in Idaho by a press club, and a discussion on a substance called DHM was a hot topic. DHM is a colorless, odorless, and a tasteless substance. It can damage body tissue in its frozen state. Excessive consumption will cause excessive sweating, nausea, vomiting, and cause imbalance in electrolytes. It can also damage the kidneys. Accidental inhalation is the third leading cause of death. 400,000 die every year worldwide, according to World Health Organization. Those who are dependent upon it will certainly die if deprived of this substance. Once these facts were released, 86% of the audience wanted to ban this substance. DHM, ladies and gentlemen, is dihydrogen monoxide water. Nobody wanted to ban it at that point because only the subtext of the overall picture was being considered. I feel today that the children, Muslim children, are also DHM. They're dehumanized Muslims. Two generations have gone. Policies are made that discriminate against them. And despite repeated pleas, looks like the board is standstill, if not going backwards. This inherent discrimination in the policy just smells of nothing but injustice, inequality, and ignoring the diversity that enriches this nation. You heard the young man, but I have another generation coming along. What message do you want them to have? The message, whatever you give, is what they shall carry in their life. Consequences of those shall be the fruit that we shall all reap. 
let's be wise, let's be smart, have the courage, as Clarence Long said, set aside biases of yours or others and make a decision. Make it equal, equal treatment, and remove this injustice. And I think that we let's not degrade your leadership or your wisdom. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tyree, Tyree Jones. Hey, Dr. Dance. Hey. Um, <laughs> hello. This is Junior Hesley, graduations. Um, first of all, um, I want to talk about that um, I've been bullied in school, and it's, it's been messing with me. The kids been messing with me for a long time, and they should they should treat me treat treat me right. Like they should treat me wrong. And I'd like to give a shout out to Morgan Marshall McKinney. She's from Oboe, and in August she going to um she going to University of Maryland. She she used to be the vice president of of Oboe High School, class of 2016. She always looked out for me, and no matter what she um she told me to stand up for yourself. Don't listen to them. Adore them, and. She always, she always, you know, look out for me, and and I'm and they, dip students call me ugly and annoying. And I'm not ugly and annoying. And then, when well, I try to fill up the uh, bully, the bully, the bully sheets, they won't fill them out. And they they think I'm aggressive wrong and I got slapped in the bus. They think I'm aggressive one. I'm not aggressive one. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. <laughs> Our next speaker is David Green. Good evening. Today I have some feedback for the folks at Johns Hopkins and their report on STAT. Um, I'll start with a story from a favorite professor of mine who, uh, who was a, one of the smartest, most concise people who wrote really great stuff. And he worked as an, as, as an analyst at, uh, in D.C. and he told us a story about working for an admiral, admiral and he wrote a, wrote a very, very clear report and the admiral came back to him and he said, could you just gray it up a little bit? Because if it was too clear, it wouldn't have gone well for the Admiral. I get the feeling that the Hopkins people have grayed up this report a little bit. It's too long, 100 pages or so. There's too much padding and paraphrasing. It's very hard to skim. For example, the key lessons in the executive summary are buried in a paragraph. They should be highlighted in bold rather than having the categories of the lessons highlighted in bold. Uh, the data is structured in a poor manner uh, that's hard to understand and hard to skim. There's too much jargon. Uh, look up, uh, I'd, I'd ask the folks from Hopkins to uh, look up the, in the Urban Dictionary online, the definition of um, summative, and they'll see some of the hostility that their jargon generates in the public. Uh, the, the audience for this report should be the parents as well as the teachers and the administrators, uh, so please make the, the language work for everybody. If you're going to talk about p-values, please explain what they are. I didn't, if, if there was an explanation of p-values in there, I didn't see it. Um, so what I recommend is, uh, is write for parents. Um, and in terms of, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, the structure of data, 
I think the, the folks from Hopkins really need to read this book by Edward Tufte called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information because they do a fairly poor job of it. This is not a new book, um, so if they want to uh, claim they have P21 skills, they should probably take his class. Um, one of the things I'd like to see them do is to structure the comments. The most important thing in any kind of survey like this is the comments. And it was hard to get a sense of what the, the essence of the comments was. And what I think they should do is sequence them so that the most common comments are at the top. And, and you say, X out of X people uh, made this kind of comment. And uh, so this was the most important, rather than having the structure that they did. Secondly, they have some conflicts of interest. Um, they have done work not only for BCPS, but also for industry groups, and that potential conflict of interest should be right up front in any presentation that they give and any report that they give. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say that I agree 100% with what Cynthia Boyd said about surveys. Uh, the surveys BCPS does are awful. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Hazel, Gr Hazel Jones. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Hazel Jones, and I'm here today because Baltimore County Public Schools has created an in, intractable in, in experience for me. I have written several complaints expecting them to be addressed, and uh, only after my con continued per persistence, some of these matters have been addressed. However, the complaints still do not have solution. One complaint that is extremely important to me was presented to Baltimore County School in a certified letter written to the principal in January 2016 and then in letters and then in letters addressed to the Board of Education and Dr. Dance from March of 2016. It involves the instru 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 it involves the intrusion of a BCPS administrator who demanded um, action that were unprofessional and in, intimidating against me in January um, 2016. I have waited patiently for this matter to be addressed, and it has not. Furthermore, I have learned on Monday, July 11, 2016, that I am required to interact with this man for educational matters. I am inform informing the Board of Education that I will not interact with this man who has intimidated me until B until BCS, BCPS resolves my complaint. I will not participate in an abusive educational relationship. Unfortunately, Rule 5580 does not apply to me, but I believe Rule 4100.6 and 4100.15 applies to me. Rule 41, 4100. Two, standards. Employee will perform their responsibilities in a sat satisfactory manner and will exhibit the professional conduct necessary to meet these responsibilities. Four, restricted activities. A, employees are prohibited from the following. The list is not all inclusive. Number six, displaying discourteous conduct or disrespect to a student, employee, or a number of people when acting in his or her official capacity. Number 15, only conduct deemed incompatible with the educational mission of the school system. I believe that the administrator's have beha behavior was disrespect and dis discouraged. Uh, furthermore, I believe not and not addressing the complaint is also disrespectful and discouraged, discourteous. Over six months have gone by, and the matter of intimidation towards me has not been addressed, as I have not been contacted by BCPS employee to investigate this complaint, and I have not received any written response that 
that this matter is being addressed, nor have I received any apology from the administrator. I don't know how, I don't know about your view, but I, if these CPS employees was intimidating to you, I am sure you and everyone else would want to um, want the matter addressed. Ignoring the in intimidation matter and my other complaints is com incompatible in the educational mission of school system and it is discourteous and disrespectful. Would you agree? Ms. Hayes Jones, sincerely. Thank you. That ends our uh, public comment section of the meeting. Our next item is unfinished business. We have the third reading of uh, policies, and I'll turn that over to Ms. Williams. Thank you, um, Mr. Thank McDaniels, you um, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, before I do so, I just want to take this opportunity to thank little Miss Jones for um, the courage to come and share with us your personal story. You're a beautiful young lady. Um, I am asking that um, appropriate steps be taken to um, review the information that you shared with us tonight. Um, with regard to first readers, there are two policies, uh, 1270 and 4005, that have been presented uh, on the agenda as Exhibit H, and the committee considered comments received during public comment at the board's June 14th, 2015 meeting, and no additional comments were received on these policies. All right, thank you. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved. Uh, the policies are policy- And 405. 1270 and 405. It's been moved. Is there any discussion at this time? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Our next item is new business, personnel matters, and uh, retirements, resignations, leaves of, leaves of absence, and an organization chart. And for that, I'll call forth Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chair McDaniels. Good evening. Thanks, Chair Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like the board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and organization chart. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. Do I have a uh, motion to approve exhibits I-1 through I-5? Four. Mr. Chair, could we break that out? Could we break the organization chart out? Yes. Uh, that's item five, correct? Four. 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 All right. Um, <laughs> All right, we'll take out item four, and I'd ask for a motion to, one through three. to um, approve exhibits I-1 through I-3. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, now for item four, did, was there uh, some discussion? Or? I'll move, I'll move okay. for it to be accepted. Is there a motion to approve item I-4? Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and a second now for the discussion. Ms. Miller? Um, yeah, I just wanted to re reiterate what I have said in the past about the organization chart being top heavy and adding layers between the superintendent and the central office staff and um, the school-based staff. All right, any other discussion? If not, then I will call for a vote on item I-4. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? One opposed. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Our next uh, item is uh, administra administrative appointments. Uh, and that I'll ask Dr. Dance to present those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, bear with me, we do have a long list of administrative appointments for the night. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal of Chadwick Elementary School, Principal of Halstead Academy, Principal of Kenwood High School, Principal of Mars Estates Elementary School, Principal of Middleborough Elementary School, Principal of Overly High School, Principal of Pikesville Middle School, Principal of Sparrows Point Middle School, 
Director of School Performance in the Office of the Community Superintendent, Executive Director of Academics, Senior Executive Director, Department of Curriculum and Instruction, Human Resources Officer in the Office of Staffing, Assistant Principal Arbutus Middle School, Assistant Principal Dundalk Elementary School, Assistant Principal McCormick Elementary School, Assistant Principal at Northwest Academy of Health Sciences, Assistant Principal Ridgely Middle School, Coordinator of World Languages, Executive Director of School Support of Secondary Office, Executive Director of Leadership Development, and Supervisor of Enterprise Systems, Engineering and Operation. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit J? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion at this time? If not, um, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any, any uh, against? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, members of the board. We'd like to introduce several new members who are new in their position as receiving uh, promotions, but also several new members uh, to our school system. First is for the principal of Chadwick Elementary School, currently right now principal of Beaumont Magnet Academy in Knox County Schools, but returning uh, to Baltimore County Public Schools. That's Mary Donna Beltrain, better known as Missy. <laughs> and Missy, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, I've got my son, Shay. Oh, Congratulations. Wow. Welcome, welcome back to Baltimore County. Next is for the Executive Director of Academics, currently right now the Coordinator of Professional Growth and Partnerships in the Department of Organizational Effectiveness. That's Dr. Mary Boswell McComas. <laughs> Mary, other than Ms. White, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? <laughs> Congratulations to you, Mary. Next is for the Senior Executive Director uh, in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction, currently right now the Executive Director in Leadership Development. Billy's always training everyone for the organization. Thank you, Billy. Uh, that's Christina Byers. Congratulations, Christina, your promotion. Any family or friends to the Unite? <laughs> Watching online. Next is for the Human Resources Officer in the Office of Staffing, currently right now an Employment Specialist with Arlington Public Schools. That's Corey Dotson. And Corey, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations. Welcome to the team, Corey. Next is for the Assistant Principal Position at McCormick Elementary School, currently right now uh, Director of School and District Support in the National Center on Time and Learning. That's Sinead Duarte. Janae, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to the team. <laughs> Welcome team. Hey. Next is for the Director of School Performance in the Office of the Community Superintendent, currently right now Principal of High Point High School and Prince George's County Public Schools, that's Sandra Jimenez. <laughs> Sandra is a UMBC grad, so Sandra, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yeah. There you go. Congratulations, Sandra. Welcome to the team. Next is for the Executive Director of School Support in the Office of Community Superintendent, currently right now an Assistant Superintendent in the School District of Philadelphia, welcoming back to Baltimore, Dr. Raquel Jones. <laughs> Raquel, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? They can stand up and be recognized as well. Congratulations. Next is for the assistant principal position in Northwest Academy of Health Sciences, currently right now a science teacher at Crossroads. That's Katrina curtin Sherrod. <laughs> and Katrina, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, I do. I have my husband, Cardinal, my son, Mandel, and Devin, and my godson. Great job. Would all of you please stand so we can recognize you? Congratulations again. Next is for the principal position at Pikesville Middle School, currently right now an assistant principal at Dundalk High School, and that's Kalisha Miller. <laughs> Kalisha, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I do. My husband, my daughter, Taylor Jan, and my former principal, Lisa Miller. Everyone oh, can please thanks. stand so we can recognize you. Congratulations again, Kalisha. Next is for the principal position at Halstead Academy, currently right now an assistant principal at Deer Park Elementary School. That's Jennifer No. <laughs> Thank you. 
Don't know if you have any family or friends here with you tonight. I do. I have my husband, Mark, my daughter, Taylor, and I have my own Smells and Major Park family. Now, I met Taylor earlier, so the entire family should stand up so we can recognize you. Yeah. Congratulations again, Jennifer. Next is for the assistant principal position at Ridgely Middle School, currently right now a social studies teacher at Perry Hall Middle School. That's Matthew Rosati. <laughs> Matthew, you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, I have my wife, Samantha, and my new Ridgely family came out. Uh -huh. You all can stand up so we can recognize you. <laughs> Next is for the principal position at Middleborough Elementary School, currently right now an assistant principal at Perry Hall Elementary School. That's Jamie Bassani. Jamie, you have any family or friends here with you tonight? I have my husband, Derek, and my former principal, Donna Bergen. Well, the entire family can stand up so we can recognize you. And congratulations to you too, Jamie. Next is for the coordinator of world languages. Right now, a supervisor of world languages. That's Kimberly Shinozaki. Kimberly, any family or friends here with you tonight? <laughs> I see Brian with a big smile on his face. Would they all please stand so we can recognize you, the entire office? <laughs> Next is for the Supervisor of Enterprise Resource Planning in the Engineering Operations Department, currently right now Systems Administration for the Division of Business Services. That's Darlene Schaefer. Next is for the assistant principal position at Dundalk Elementary School. Currently right now a stat teacher at Scholars K-8. That's Jennifer Zemanski. Zemanski. There you go, Jennifer. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Jennifer Zemanski. Congratulations. Any family or friends here with you tonight? I have my mom, oh, my great. principal, Mr. Parker, and my former teacher and principal, Ms. Thomas. Congratulations to you. Next is for the assistant principal position at Arbutus Middle School, currently right now a science teacher at Pine Grove Middle School. That's Perry Warren. <laughs> Perry, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Yes, my wife Emily. Congratulations to you too. <laughs> Next is for the principal position at Sparrows Point Middle School, currently right now a principal of Vernon Johns Junior High School in Petersburg City Public Schools in Virginia. That's Ms. Shannon Washington. And Shannon, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? This wonderful family adopted me <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Welcome on board, Shannon. <laughs> Next is for the principal position at Overly High School. Currently right now an assistant principal at Randallstown High School. That's Ms. Monica Sample. <laughs> Monica, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations. <laughs> and Monica, I want to thank you for your flexibility today, too. Congratulations. And last but not least, for the principalship position at Kenwood High School, currently right now an assistant principal at Overly High School, it's Brian Powell. <laughs> Brian, do you have any family or friends here with you tonight? Congratulations, Brian. Thank you again for your flexibility today. <laughs> Mr. Chair, that concludes the administrative appointments. Congratulations to all of our new administrators to Baltimore County, but also congratulations to the folks who are newly promoted into your position. Welcome to Team BCPS. Thank you, Dr. Dance, and congratulations to all. Um, our next agenda item is new business, and this is, uh, we'll take, okay, okay. We'll, give a, we'll give a moment for those who are leaving.
and we were sitting <laughs> Mom wanted to say something to Kyrie. She's leaving. The young lady, the little girl. Kyrie. Jones. Yeah. Is she leaving? Isn't she? <sighs> so maybe you can catch her. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Nussbaum. You can uh, go ahead if you would. Good, good, evening. good evening. Earlier this evening, the Board of Education considered three appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in its quasi-judicial capacity. One was an oral argument where the Board heard from uh, the parties and their attorneys. Uh, two, two of these were considered on the record as there was no request for oral arguments made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in that closed session in those matters, which were uh, hearing examiner number 16-12 with regard to the oral argument and hearing, hearing examiner numbers 16-54 and 16-55 regarding the summary affirmances. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So okay. moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's moved into second. Any discussion at this time? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. And the orders will be on the on the uh, table. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Mr. Nussbaum. Our next item is new business uh, contract awards. Uh, call forth Mr. Saris, and then also turn it over to Mr. Gillis. Thank you, Mr. McDaniel's. The, earlier today, the uh, Building and Contracts Committee met and considered uh, items L1 through L16. Uh, Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit uh, answered questions from committee members, and we now um, offer uh, for board approval based upon the committee's unanimous vote items L1 through L16. All right, before I ask for a motion, does anyone want to separate any of the items? Uh, Mr. Birch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like uh, item number four, MW82915, Contract Modifications, Secondary Language Arts Anthologies. You want that separated, correct? Please, just have a question. Okay, and Ms. Miller? I can separate number two, but I've got questions on some other ones as well. Okay, all right, but we can vote on them as a group. Okay, so L2 and L4 will be separated. So I'll ask for a motion to uh, approve item L1. L3 and L5 through 16. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Oh, I don't need a second. All right. Uh, any discussion on those items? If not, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, I have discussion. <laughs> yeah, you did tell me that, didn't you? Okay, uh, before um, we vote. Yes. I have discussion on um, 6, 7, 11, and 12, just brief. Um, number 6. Um, would this um, would this program be accessible through BCPS one? Is that how it would be accessed? Um, this is item six. Item six. Then I have to uh, ask yeah. Yeah. Okay. Lita <laughs> to <laughs> confirm. It integrates with BCPS one. Okay. Okay, and I'm wondering. Okay, because we had that discussion um, prior about the new vendor agreements. Will this vendor then be required to agree to the terms of the new vendor agreement rego regarding um, student information, data, you know, sharing of data? Yes, it's part of the contract. That's part of our contract language with all the vendors that we're entering. Okay, so is this the first one that will then be entering into that <coughs> agreement? No, it's not, it's not the first one. Okay, thank you. Um, and on number seven, um, can you explain why this was sole sourced? Um, it is not sole sourced in terms of the legal definition. Uh, this is uh, purchased uh, under the uh, state provision that allows a curriculum to be selected 
uh, without a competitive bid uh, based on the uh, alignment with our curriculum and our instructional needs. Okay, thank you. Um, what else did I say, 11 and 12? Number 11, could you break down the funding source? It says it's coming from the operating budget and from grants. Can you tell me how much from each? And are those federal grants? Um, the grants are mentioned because some Title I schools will purchase supplies from this uh, vendor. Uh, generally, uh, as I uh, mentioned, these are purchases made directly by principals for school budgets. Um, our uh, school budgets total approximately $24 million, and that's what's allocated directly to schools. And that would be the primary uh, funding source in the general fund. And whatever uh, grant funds, primarily through Title I, would be budgeted in the special revenue fund and through that particular grant. Thank you. And number 12, what was the original contract amount? Um, the system, uh, well, this is an original contract. This is a new contract that does not, uh, it replaces something that is uh, many years old and out of use. I don't have the information on that product. I know that the annual maintenance fees for that predecessor product were approximately $70,000 a year, which is uh, comparable uh, to this product, but I don't have the exact complete contract value for that. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're not using the same vendor. Um, will this system be um, servicing and tracking issues with the student devices? Is it, is it going to be basically um, replacing Destiny? No, not at all. This is a... Um, a help desk software to track uh, customer service requests that are handled by the Department of Technology for all of the schools, and it will be adapted to a number of other purposes, uh, such as um, facilities, Department of F Facilities work orders, uh, transportation uh, maintenance and work orders, and uh, customer service requests generally from the community and uh, many departments participated in the evaluation so that they would all be able to uh, determine how they would best be able to use the product. Okay, so nothing regarding the devices? No. No, no support for the devices? No. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions on those items that are currently on the table? If not, I would ask uh, all those in favor of item L1, L3, and L5 through 16, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. All right, the next item I think we'll break out was item L2, and was that Ms. Miller, I believe? Yes. yes. Um. Can't um, pull it Ms. Up Miller, right before now, you, so. uh, maybe we'll get a motion on the table and then we'll discuss it. Is there a motion to approve item L2? So, so move. Second? Oh, we don't need a second. Okay. Now for the discussion. I can't pull it up, so I'm just going by my notes here. Um, I've been getting feedback from some stakeholders um, that about 10 to 20 percent of the assessment items were developed by BCPS teachers. Would you say that's a, about a correct? Um, I don't have information at that level of detail, so I would defer to Dr. Brown or his staff. So the proportion of items that were developed by BCPS teachers um, varied by assessment. That being said, um, these assessments are being developed by BCPS teachers for BCPS teachers, and the BCPS teachers have been able to put their fingerprint on every item because they evaluate every single item that goes into uh, the test. 
So if it's about 10 to 20 percent, who is involved in the development of the rest? So item development is done in, in two parts. Again, part of it's done by BCPS teachers and part of it's done by professional item writers. <coughs> but again, no item makes it to a test without BCPS teachers evaluating that item, potentially modifying that item. They have modified them in occasion uh, before they make it into an item format for our students. Thank you. Um, now, I understand is this, this is uh, part one of a two-part unit assessment is that right and can you can you explain that sure uh, these assessments are aligned to our curriculum and at the conclusion of each curricular unit there are two unit assessments one which is based on closed responses which are focused on individual skills and another which is based on a performance-based task these mirror the demands of uh, career and college readiness assessments that you see across the country and it is intended to give our students the opportunity to show what they know related to the curriculum that they've just been taught. Um, so the uh, required test then is park, map two times a year. Um, these periodic assessments, the part one, which are going to be six to eight times per year, is that right? Five to six. Five to six. And then the unit assessments, which is part two, which will be how many times per year? So let's be clear, though. This is a unit assessment, which for those of us who taught, when we concluded a unit, we typically gave some sort of assessment. These replace what would typically be the unit assessment and provide a level of uniformity and consistency and quality across our system so that we have equitable assessments across the system. These are a replacement. Contrary to, say, a map assessment or a park assessment, these don't require changes in schedules for the buildings. These happen within a normal instructional period and are meant to replace something and actually relieve a task for a teacher uh, to have to develop that assessment. Uh, so how many times per year is the unit, the part two, then given? Again, these vary it based on the number of units that are in the curriculum by grade okay. and by subject. And okay, so I, I understand your explanation on part two. On part one, um, there's already end of unit assessments right now in, in ELA and math. So what is this adding then? And, and is this needed? Is this, uh, I'm, I'm just questioning testing. the amount of, well, of testing of here. Testing. So really? actually this development for these types of assessments began before some of the members of the board are here, and it's probably worth talking about that because it started back in 1415. The intention for this was for our staff and our, our teachers and our <coughs> curricular staff to be able to develop assessments that align directly to our curriculum, so are blueprinted to our curriculum, that follow our curricular units exactly, so that they're highly valid. They, they measure what has been taught. Uh, they leverage the content expertise of our teachers to be able to develop them, while at the same time using a vendor to help guide the process so that we have high quality assessments so that we can build our own uh, model for man monitoring growth throughout the academic year so that we understand in a very timely fashion whether or not our kids are making adequate progress as they move forward. So the primary purpose for this is to be able to monitor growth and to be able to intervene when students aren't making adequate growth. Uh, but at the same time, these are given at the end of the unit before teachers are moving on. So it, what is the purpose of this? Is this intended to measure student performance, teacher performance, or school performance? And um, talk a little bit about how that does that as an end of unit test. So as a end of, again, typical end of unit assessments are used to measure proficiency with the content that has been taught to that point in time. Uh, much like, again, any of us who've taught, when you finished a unit, you gave a test and you measured whether or not summatively kids had learned what they were supposed to learn by that point in time. By giving them more frequently, you do give an opportunity for folks to reteach. They can go back and teach things that students haven't learned to date, and they can adapt the lessons as they move forward. The, the intention here is to inform instruction. So this is assessing student, student performance. Student learning and student growth. Um, 
Have you received any concerns about the quality or development of these tests by teachers or staff members? It's fairly early in the development process. Again, this year we just got done field testing the items. So the forms have not, for many of the content areas, haven't been constructed yet, the final forms. Uh, we are mid-development um, on those final forms. So no, I haven't. But you've received some input, correct? We've received input and we've modified what we've been doing along the line based on the input from our teachers and staff. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Collins. <clears throat> Dr. Brown. Oh. <coughs> um, you're correct, of course, in what you said about uh, teachers giving a test at the end of a unit. Um, we always made them up uh, <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> I mean, we, we created our own tests. Frequently, the textbook company put out tests that you could use some of the questions or all of the questions if you chose or whatever. Um, teachers aren't making up their own tests anymore? Teachers have the, the ability to make up their own tests, certainly. That this does not preclude that. This would allow a teacher, instead of having being required to develop an assessment, they can use an assessment that's being used across the system and would be comparable across schools. So, so uh, the t uh, teachers are going to be, I said, I realize you said we're just getting this going, but uh, every teacher in every subject is going to be required to give a uh, standardized test uh, created as described to, to Ann um, at some point in time in the future uh, throughout the course of the year. These assessments, again, would fall at the end of a unit. I understand uh, completely. I wouldn't call it necessarily a standardized assessment in the sense of, you know, we're not reporting them out like a park assessment or the MSA or, or, or. Where, where are they being reported? Any, anywhere? These would be used to inform instruction. They'd be reported back to the teachers and, and, their fam and the students' families to, to be able to, again, to inform instruction as we move forward. The results of those tests would be given by the teacher to their students, like, well, teachers always gave tests back, obviously. Um, and the students would be told to take them home? <coughs> the students would have, I would assume, have the opportunity to take those home, those results, yes. Right, is, is that, is, are, are the results of those tests going to be another burden on teachers to report somewhere to, uh, to the principal or to some central office where then it's all gonna be aggregated and, and we see how we're doing? Uh, is this another um, task of busy work for teachers? This is not at all intended to be a task of busy work for teachers. Are we intending to collect it and are you intending to have it come to your office in some fashion? So let's be clear. I absolutely intend to have some of this data come to my office because I want to be able to monitor growth across the system and to ensure that kids are making adequate growth over time. It will be integrated with other data that we use uh, to make decisions about students, and we feed back to buildings to help them understand when kids are getting off track. We do that already, but this will allow us to do it more frequently. So we've <laughs> used MAP as a, well, think about it, um, Mr. Collins. I think the answer is yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, well, that was data, good. Yes, that would be good. coming back to me, yes. Yeah, that would be good. I, uh, yes, will, yes, will do. So it is, it is a lot more, I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but it, in fact, will, will create a lot more um, uh, busy work for teachers. I, busy work in the sense of having to put it someplace else, report it someplace else. The, the work for the teacher is when they when they hear it for themselves and they give it to the students. Yeah, they okay. don't really care yeah, about giving it to your office or the principal or the department head or anybody else. Yeah, let me clarify that though. The, the teachers won't have to put in another system. This test is being delivered through BCPS1. So it will be scored by BCPS1. The teacher doesn't have to score it and the teacher doesn't have to do anything for the data to come to me. Oh, good, good. So we, this has really been done quite intentionally to minimize and, and really take work away from teachers yeah. so that they well, have I was, I was happy them. with it until you went, went on a little <laughs> further with your explanation yeah. because uh, it, it is fair. Uh, we hear from the Teachers Association often right. through, through the president or usually through Abby. So tonight it was through uh, John, but um, you know, and they're, they're increasingly concerned about the burden of all of this data that uh, is being um, required. And I just am kind of trying to look out for uh, my old professionals to make sure we're not overdoing it. But if we have, if we have good ways of uh, 
accomplishing the task, that's great because obviously we want to have the kids college and career ready when they graduate. I get it. And we don't want to, uh, and to be honest, Abby's been involved in this process throughout and has been aware of what we're doing. We have no intention of adding an additional burden in terms of data entry. Good, good. Thank you. Ms. Bratt, I think you had a question. In there. Um, yes, I would just like to clarify, did you say that this would increase the rate of testing or the it would, frequency? It would increase the frequency. Uh, so in our grades three through eight, mm -hmm. uh, students tend to have assessments three times a year. Uh, so we have one at the start of the year, one mid midpoint of the year with math assessment. That's a very long window of instructional time not to have feedback. And it allows a lot of instruction to go by without having feedback to, to inform the types of changes that we would like to have happen. Have you, is there any demonstration or data that indicates that the current rate of assessment is not adequate to make changes to teaching curriculum for the next year or to inform us adequately? I have heard, so when we started down this road, and this would have been about two years ago, we actually had quite a lot of feedback from both teachers and principals that they wanted more frequent assessment that was directly aligned to the curricular units, that the windows of time were actually too long. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Johnson. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so a few questions. So this is not a standardized test, but it's a test that's been created that can be used throughout the county. And you said, do the teachers still have the option to create their own tests? Absolutely. So if we're trying to create, create equity, will that option ever be taken away? Because now some teachers, uh, teachers are still allowed to create a five-question test if they want to, and then the other teachers are creating or are having to use this. 30 question test. So when I think about assessment, I think of a balanced assessment system. You want to have um, a variety of components in it. So you want some performance-based tasks which occur multiple times during, during a unit and then sum, summative at the end. You want to have something that has closed response formats that allows them uh, to gather highly reliable data that allows for monitoring a growth periodically. But when I think about a full assessment model, I could see teachers creating short cycle assessments in between uh, because a unit might last six weeks. I could see a, a teacher creating a three or four item assessment at the end of a week and they certainly have the, the uh, means to be able to do that. I also see teachers, uh, and we actually got quite a um, sort of a push towards formative assessment practices where you weave assessment into the instructional process and it's not a formal task so much as something that you're doing as you uh, deliver instruction all, every day. So this becomes part of a constellation of assessment activities to inform instruction. And again, it's aligned to the units over time. So then no, there isn't going to be anything standardized. The teachers can create quizzes throughout the, throughout the. Teachers have an opportunity to create quizzes. The items that would be available for that in the, the uh, SMS would be uh, standardized mm -hmm. or have been to this date. Um, these assessments at the end of the unit would be standardized and the decision as to whether or not they would be mandated, I don't believe has made it. Okay, and so, um, okay. Um, and so, so these tests will all be online or will they be any, any sort of paper tests these for are accessibility? All okay, all right, so there's no, once they access the, te uh, the reason I asked is because students will be students, so this year, your teacher is going to give you the test in seventh grade science, and then next year your friend's going to have that same test in seventh grade science. So there is no way to cheat from year to year. It's going to be that. It's going to be. They can't print out the test. They can't go back on to BCPS one and access the test or anything no, like that. No, they they can't do that. And part of what is in this contract that you're looking at today actually involves an intentional replenishment of items over time, so that the test is never really the same each year because we're intentionally. Uh, adding additional items uh, to reflect changes in, in content and or curriculum, but also to refresh to the test. So it's not always the same test each year. Thank you. All right. Are there any dis other discussion on item L2? Uh, if not, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Two opposed. Um, all right. Uh, Ms. Brett. All right. So the motion carries. Uh, the next item is item L4. Uh, can I have a motion to um, accept item L4? So moved. All right, any discussion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we've commented many times, uh, because of all the different types of medium 
uh, that, uh, that are out there, uh, kids, uh, our students pick and choose what they like, what they don't like, and what they'll use for certain specific tasks. And I note this particular contract um, contemplates in the second bullet point, materials will include both hard copy class sets and individual digital access for teachers and students. George, you and I had an opportunity to talk prior to um, the public meeting. I happened to catch you as you were walking out, and I'd asked you, uh, because a parent uh, had asked me, um, how many copies are there, uh, these hard um, uh, copy, um, how many are there um, in an individual class, for example? I mean, I know you got you got the students, then you have like the extras for the ones that get, you know, maybe lost or uh, the dog eats them up or they get run over by a bus or something. How many are there? So the typical elementary classroom set consists of 30 books uh, at the secondary level. Uh, many classes, many class sets are 35, and when items are lost or damaged, they are replaced at the school level. So that there should always be at least the number that's in the class set. And classes are typically smaller than 35 and 30. I uh, appreciate the answer. Um, you know, the sixth grade level language arts anthology materials, you know, some of the materials uh, or some of the uh, subject areas covered can be, uh, um, can require a lot of attention. And while one, think, one would think reading uh, from a screen might be pretty easy to do, comprehension tends to be somewhat less than uh, oftentimes using a book according to a fair number of studies. I appreciate you letting us know, and I'm sure the parents out there and has heard. Uh, but I would also like to compliment uh, our colleagues on the curriculum committee, and in particular my friend, Chair Marisol Johnson, uh, because as I read here, uh, it says that the materials, the, this material was discussed at the curriculum committee on May 20th, 2015, as opposed to uh, having uh, been approved by the curriculum committee on May 20th, 2015. So I want to thank the chair for that most no noteworthy and transparent change. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Yes, Mr. Collins. George, um, I'm intrigued. <clears throat> You said at the school level they're going to replenish books that uh, vanish. Correct. How are we going to go about doing that? The school uses their school budget, and um, they also, of course, have some leverage in uh, eliciting replacement from the student if the student is responsible in some way for damaging. But the school budget is adequate to replace, not to fully stock a classroom set, replace individual items. And we don't have any idea on how fast the turnaround time is from if you're buying one book from the uh, publisher. Um, many of these books are available through the eSchool Mall. Uh, so it's pretty fast. So it, it can be done <coughs> very quickly, yes. So, so because, you know, we, we also have been assured that students students can take these books home Correct. overnight. Correct. You know, but and once that happens, you know, kids may get sick. You know, at like uh, all of the all of the ways a book can be late coming back. You know, and um, are you sure our class sizes of such uh, control that 35 and 30 is going to be enough? I know that's not your department. I'm just teasing. Correct. I'm sorry, <laughs> tossing that out there for the rest of you. <clears throat> Pay attention, Dallas. Thank you. Any other questions on uh, item L4? Doesn't appear you are. All right. <laughs> <laughs> not, not paying attention. Take a note of that, everyone. If not, all those in favor of item L4, <laughs> please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> uh, any abstentions? If not, uh, the motion carries. L4 carries. I think that's it for the contract yes. items. All right. I think Mr. Saris is still up for our next uh, item of business. It's new business, uh, transfer and supplements. Uh, so Mr. Saris, I'll turn it over to you. For Thank you. Um, as uh, was publicly uh, reported back in May, the superintendent proposed using uh, the BCPS uh, fund balance or what some call the reserve 
uh, to advance the air conditioning of Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, which is a major undertaking. We waste no time. And uh, your staff. we identified that uh, $20 million from the general fund, which uh, at the time, be which began the year at $47.5 million, would be available and could be transferred to Baltimore County government for their capital program, which far exceeds this amount. Uh, 83 million is the total package that county executive candidates has proposed, of which 20 million dollars will be uh, contributed by Baltimore County Public Schools with the approval of the board this evening. Uh, our current projection uh, is that uh, we will, the fund balance of 47.5 million that we had on July 1 of 2015 uh, will be approximately $62 million when we uh, finally uh, reconcile our books from June 30, 2016. Uh, of this $62 million, the FY17 budget appropriates $23 million uh, to support the operating budget. This additional $20 million transfer to county government would uh, leave us at the beginning of the year with $18.8 .8 million, which I believe is adequate uh, for the purposes of operating the system this year. And uh, the Baltimore County Council uh, has, will consider a um, uh, supplemental capital appropriation at its August meeting. and. Uh, I will bring a supplemental appropriation proposal back to the board to reflect the change that they have proposed so that our two <coughs> budgets will be in alignment for fiscal 2017. And I would recommend that we approve this transfer. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the transfer of fiscal Better. year 2017 general fund balance? Yes. It's so moved. Is that second. A second? It's been moved and second. Is there any discussion at this time? Ms. Miller? Are we being asked to approve just the 20 million transfer or also that 23 million appropriation that you mentioned? The, uh, tonight we were speaking only about the 20 million. The $23 million figure, um, was uh, is already been uh, adopted by county council for us for 2017. At the time the board uh, proposed its budget, that figure was about $19 million, and that was increased by the executive and the council to $23 million. Okay, and that's going to leave us with about $19 million which you said would be appropriate. Is there any kind of industry guidelines or standards on what would be a target general fund balance well, for systems of um, size? There is for systems which are fiscally independent, which we are not. Of course, we have no revenue other than what is uh, appropriated by the General Assembly and the County Council. Um, for fiscally independent entities, three to five percent is a good uh, target, and I think that you'll find that that's where we were previously. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, any other discussion or comments? If not, um, all those in favor of the transfer, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, uh, Mr. Saris. Thank you very much. Our, our next uh, item is new business, a report on policies, and this is our first reading, and for that I'll turn that over to Ms. Williams. Um, good evening again, Mr. McDaniels, Chair and members of the board. Uh, PRC is presenting for first reader uh, which has been presented to you as Agenda Exhibit N. Now, before I go on, is there any way we can cut more lights on? I can't see. Pete, um, is there a contract tonight for improved lighting? <laughs> they tried to keep it cool up here. 
It, it is hot also, yeah. but I really, it's very difficult to read. Um, and I really don't need my glasses for close up, so I know you all are saying, put your glasses on, but, <laughs> but actually that would not help. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I'm recommending that uh, policies 1300, 5250, 5520, 5530, 5561, and 6401 be moved forward. Oh, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just make them up for a minute. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Be moved forward for second read. Actually, that's much better. Thank you so much. Um, and I know some of these policies are controversial, and, and I, I just want to say um, to the public, um, we thank you for your comments. We do listen to your comments. Um, and I do just want to also say, remember that as strongly as you feel sometimes about the position you're advocating, there's usually someone else who feels equally strongly about the opposite position. And so we do try to take into consideration um, everyone's comments, but we thank you for them. So at this time, the committee is recommending uh, moving those policies forward. We are taking, PRC is making uh, no recommendation with regard to policy 1280 for the simple reason uh, there was not a majority uh, vote by PRC to move it forward, but we are moving it forward. Okay. All right. So um, do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's PRC committee? To, to move these forward. So moved. Yes, move to move it forward. Uh, any discussion at this time? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you. All right, uh, our next item is new business, end of year stat evaluation. And for that, I'd like to call Dr. Brown, Dr. Ross, and Dr. Morrison forward. So I will be brief in my introduction. Um, we have our, our colleagues from Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Research and Reform and Education, uh, Dr. Ross and Dr. Morrison, who have um, will be presenting now the second annual report on the STAT uh, program. And with that, I am going to hand things hey, over to that. Drs. Ross and Dr. Morrison. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Brown, um, Mr. McDaniels, and Dr. Dance, it's, and members of the board. It's nice to see you again. Um, a number of you have heard this beginning presentation. Um, basically, what I do is a warm up for Jennifer, but some of you have heard this like several times in terms of the logic model regarding the evaluation and the initiative to some degree. But others are new and haven't heard it, so we're gonna go through it again. Um, but we'll be brief, it's, it's getting late. Um, the evaluation model is based on um, discussion and analysis of what is reasonable to expect in an initiative such as STAT. So what would you expect to happen? Ultimately, the goal is to raise student achievement, but as prior initiatives have shown and as um, instructional theory has shown, you don't roll in devices and then student achievement goes up the same year. Things have to happen. And what happens are basically outputs of um, inputs, that are um, implemented. And so the logic model shows that the initial input, and that's true with virtually any educational intervention that involves instruction, is professional development. So a very large part of STAT during the first two and three years and ongoing as more and more schools get involved is professional development for administrators, for STAT teachers, and classroom teachers. Professional development gives teachers the knowledge, the attitudes, the skills to be able to use the devices in a way that is um, designed to improve student achievement. Given those inputs, and all of this is ongoing, um, both with the original Lighthouse teachers and more and more schools that are coming aboard every year, what would be initial outputs that you would get? Again, not student achievement right away, because to get student achievement to go up, you have to have high quality instruction. And so initial um, outputs that we would expect to occur in year one, a little bit in year two, would be changes in the classroom environment, and Jennifer will be talking about some of those results. Do classrooms look different than they used to? 
Are there changes in the wind in terms of how classrooms look different? And by the way, judgment, evaluation means judgment, but, it's, but the reports are written to help all of you decide whether things are going in the right direction that you feel will raise achievement. Okay, um, that one just went off, so it's really, let me just see if I can, I'll, I can read it from here, because that's way too far away. Um, <clears throat> another initial input would be, initial output, I'm sorry, would be changes in teacher practice. So you'd expect to see pedagogy changing. And this should happen fairly early, but it should, but it should be more visible and more frequent over time. And then we should see early changes, year one and year two, in the use of digital content so that students and teachers can um, obtain information on lessons, information on um, what other teachers are doing, access resources. Also, a relatively early output would be, but which again will take place more over time, would be in students, it would be in student engagement. How are students acting differently as a result of more personalized learning and using devices? What does behavior look like? And um, as we'll talk about, there are good things that you see and there are also problems that occur. And part of the evaluation is to bring those problems to you so that they can be addressed as part of the implementation. Um, what takes a little bit longer are the P21 skills. It's they? not easy to teach an inquiry lesson or a pro problem-based or project-based lesson. That requires a lot of practice, a lot of sharing, a lot of communication. So we'll be talking about what we've seen in the early run. And what is P21 ultimately, mean? with improved instruction, <laughs> Joe, diff different type. What does P21 mean? P21 means 21st century skills. Okay. Um, problem solving. Problem solving, inquiry. <clears throat> They were you know, skills. It, it, it's what we used to call higher order learning. Yeah, yeah, they were skills 55 years ago when I started teaching, but yeah. I'm glad they're 21st century also. Thank you. Those are even higher. Okay. <clears throat> and then ultimately with changes in pedagogy, changes in engagement, one would look to changes in student achievement where students would be achieve, achieving higher on the um, MAP test on the PARC test, but that remains to be um, determined as we look at that in um, subsequent years. So Jennifer will now present the results so for this year. For this year. So our end of year report examined professional development that was received um, from the district as offered to classroom teachers over the summer, as well as the support received by classroom teachers from staff teachers throughout the school year. We examined staff teacher roles and best practices and then we examine the impact of professional development on the measurable outcomes, which are displayed in the green and purple boxes. Uh, last, we looked at the perceptions of the STAT initiative from various stakeholders, including principals, classroom teachers, STAT teachers, um, parents, and students. It is important to note that there's a difference in experience and implementation of the group. So Lighthouse Elementary grades one through three are now in their second year of implementation. And the other groups, like our non-Lighthouse 1 through 3 elementary students, Lighthouse Middle Grade 6, and Lighthouse Elementary K4 and 5 are in their first year of implementation. So the expectations were a little bit different. Our data sources for the end of year evaluation included interviews and focus groups with principals, stat teachers, and classroom teachers. The classroom teacher survey that our center developed and it was administered to lighthouse schools and phase two elementary schools. Phase two elementary schools are a subset of the non-lighthouse elementary schools. We also examined stat teacher program survey results. This survey was developed by BCPS. It was administered to all lighthouse and non-lighthouse elementary and middle school teachers. We also conducted classroom observations in April in Lighthouse schools and phase two elementary schools. We observed 123 classrooms for 20 minutes each. The classrooms were randomly selected. And that resulted in 2,460 minutes of observations. 
Just a quick note about the instrument that we used. It was the Oasis 21. It was co-constructed between our center and BCPS to make sure that what we were intending to observe aligned with Baltimore County goals. We conducted a reliability study of the instrument in the spring of 2015. That meant that two observers independently rated the same classrooms and we looked at the relationship between the ratings. What we found was that um, the reliability of the um, ratings by the two observers was 0.972. So for a frame of reference, reliability can range from zero to one, and anything above 0.7 is deemed acceptable in the world of research, and ours was at a 0.972, which lends some credibility to the observations. Another component we examined was digital content usage, so how teachers were using BCPS1 and how students were using BCPS1. We examined student behavioral data, including attendance, office referrals, and suspensions in Lighthouse schools. And last, a new component that we looked at for this year was the stat-specific climate survey items. So three items were added by BCPS to the climate survey that's administered to all stakeholders in the district. We looked at parent and student responses in elementary and middle schools. So a quick preview of our year two results. Research on school district technology integration initiatives shows that there's higher student engagement in these schools that have one-to-one -one device programs. There's increases in student-centered instruction and improved student achievement. And this actually is a very recent study just published in one of the top educational journal journals. The second year results in Baltimore County show that there are promised promising changes from teacher to student-centered learning. Specifically, teachers are shifting from presenting instruction to more coaching students through the learning process. There's a focus on using data to customize instruction, so responding to students' needs. And then also, there's a strong impact on student engagement. So the first component that we looked at was the professional development that um, was offered both by the district and by the STAT teachers. The data source for this measure first was the STAT teacher program survey that was administered to all classroom teachers in BCPS. And then we also conducted interviews and classroom teacher, teacher focus groups to obtain perceptions of participants on the STAT teacher. One of the survey items on the STAT Teacher Program survey looked at to what degree teachers are participating in different professional development modes, whether it's large group, small group, independent learning, and individual support. April surveys, or this most frequent April survey, indicated that small group instruction, like grade level, team, or content area meetings, was reported as the most frequent form of professional development among Lighthouse Elementary teachers and non-Lighthouse grades one through three teachers. What was slightly different was that the Lighthouse teachers in grade six reported the most frequent participation in large group professional development, which was then followed by small group professional development. Overall, the Lighthouse Elementary and Middle School classroom teachers participated in significantly more professional development opportunities as compared to those in non-Lighthouse schools. The difference was most apparent in individual support and independent learning. Also, where Lighthouse Elementary School teachers participated in similar rates of modes between years, the non-Lighthouse Elementary and Lighthouse Middle School teachers increased participation in professional development, which is to be expected now that these teachers are implementing SAT this year. In terms of perceptions of the SAT teacher, Classroom teachers and principals within the schools viewed the STAT teacher as critical to the successful implementation of STAT. Importantly, classroom teachers in non-Lighthouse elementary schools had significantly more positive views towards their STAT teacher last year as compared with this year. The views of participants appeared to be a bit mixed in terms of how valuable the summer district professional development was. Regardless, participants indicated that the STAT teacher really intervened and provided any needed professional throughout the school year. Consistent with prior reports, the STAT teacher continues to be a very critical component to implementation fidelity. They offer a variety of professional development modes and learning opportunities that classroom, classroom teachers really view as valuable. 
There do appear to be lingering concerns with the roles and responsibilities of the stat teacher, and that's primarily in non-lighthouse schools. Further, stat teachers seem to need to have not only of a knowledge of technology, but the instructional, they need to possess strong instructional competencies in order to properly coach and model effective instructional practices. So overall, classroom or principals indicated that teachers were prepared to implement STAT, but classroom teachers provided mixed views when you look at their survey responses as compared to what they told us in the focus groups. It appears that the summer professional development covered a lot of different topics, but may not have gone into enough detail for teachers to implement STAT at the start of the school year. STAT teachers in schools, however, are consistently viewed as a valuable resource because of the professional development and support that they offer to teachers. There does appear to be a need for a stronger focus on instructional practices and then the effective integration of technology. The next section of the logic model that we examined was the impact on measurable outcomes, specifically classroom environment, teacher practice, and digital content. In order to assess the impact on classroom environment and teacher practice, we conducted our classroom observations, and then we conducted interviews and focus groups with participants. Access to digital content was examined through BCPS1 usage data. So our observation instrument had um, mostly a five-point scale. There were two items that looked at a three-point scale, but the remainder had a five-point scale. Observers rated the degree to which they saw this component implemented in the 20 minutes that they were in the classroom, and they rated it, again, on a scale kind of from one to five. So one would be not observed. They, during the 20 minutes, they never saw this strategy or observation item um, implemented in the classroom. Rarely meant that it received little emphasis or time during the 20 minutes. Somewhat occasionally meant it received modest emphasis or modest amount of time in class. Mm -hmm. Frequently was that it received a substantial emphasis and then extensively meant that the strategy was highly prevalent during the 20 minutes. Just some highlights of classroom environment. All of the groups that we observed exhibited improvement in two of the classroom items. Classrooms were more likely to display information and resources that supported independent thinking the improvement in our spring the observations as compared with baseline observations for phase two elementary grades one through three was significant across the time points. As might be expected in lower grades, the students in elementary grades were more likely to be observed utilizing different learning environments as compared with Lighthouse middle grade six. All groups though showed improvement in this practice as compared with baseline observations. So overall, classrooms reflected student-centered learning environments in their physical arrangement and the information. Students weren't often observed independently acquiring materials and resources, though the availability of devices may preclude the need for students to get out of their seats and obtain an encyclopedia or other resources. As might be expected in the lower grades, students in elementary grades were more likely to be observed utilizing different workspaces. In terms of the impact on teacher practice, um, it's evident in the decline across all groups in the extent to which teachers were observed standing in front of the classroom presenting information. For Lighthouse, or phase two elementary grades one through three, the decline in teacher presentation was significant when you compared it to baseline observations. With the exception of that group, the other groups we observed teachers equally, or um, more often than not presenting, or, uh, facilitating instruction than presenting information. With phase two, grades one through three, it was about equal. Teachers were about split between presenting information and facilitating learning. According to survey results, teachers reported that they do lecture and present information to a relatively frequent extent. There was also an increased occurrence of students grouped based on needs, whether it was student ability level or task needs. For two of the groups, the significant or the improvement was significant as compared with baseline observations. So overall, as conveyed through observations, interviews, focus groups, and survey items, there's been an impact on st um, of STAT on teacher practice. Teachers generally were observed facilitating instruction more frequently than presenting information. As principals noted during interviews, the collaboration amongst the teachers within their buildings implementing that 
as they're implementing STAT, it's um, impacted teacher practice because they're sharing best practices and some of the tools that they're finding that helpful to inform their learning. Both STAT teachers and classroom teachers described an increased focus on individual student needs and teachers responding to student needs by personalizing instruction. So one of the aspects that we examined in terms of digital content usage was how teachers were using BCPS1. Specifically, we looked at the frequency that they were creating different tiles. And I'm hoping you understand the tiles because I'm not as well versed in tiles as I know others are. But tiles are categories of information that they can present to students. So they can have links on a tile so students can access an external link for information. They can um, create files for students to access. They can create assignments. So they're kind of categories. So as you can see in the two charts, the proportion of assignment tiles declined between last year semester two and this year of semester two. Assignment and the proportion of instruction related tiles, such as repository content link oh, and instruction funny. tiles increased. All of the groups implementing STAT this year significantly increased the number of test tiles, assignment tiles, and instruction tiles between last year and this year. There were also increases, often significant, in the number of link and repository content tiles. So similar to the increases in tiles created, student views also increased between last year and this year. The most substantial increases in student views of tiles were observed for link and repository content tiles. And teachers also described how they're using BCPS1 in their teacher practices. They often reported the most frequent use of BCPS1 was to deliver instruction. So interviews revealed the ability to customize lessons for students based on needs, and that was viewed as a success with technology integration by teachers. In addition, teachers described students' improved technological competence and the positive impact on student engagement. Though there were benefits of technology integration um, that teachers recognized, they also described challenges with students' inappropriate behavior and off-task device use. The problem was a particular issue in upper elementary and middle grades, but instances did occur across all grades. There were also challenges expressed when devices malfunctioned or when BCPS1 was down, and so teachers always needed to have a backup plan, such as print-based instruction. So we also examined the impact on professional development for student engagement and 21st century skills. We expected that since STAT was still in its first year of implementation for three of the four groups and only the second year for Lighthouse grades one through three, we might see a small amount of evidence relating to the impact on student engagement in 21st century. Classroom observations revealed a high level of student engagement overall. Changes across time for observation items varied between groups. So three out of four groups increased the use of digital tools and independent work. Three out of four groups decreased formal collaborative learning and formal student discussion. Across all schools and from all data sources, the impact on student engagement appears to be prominent. Observations indicated student engagement in classrooms, whether students used digital tools, they completed independent work, or engaging in discussion or collaborative learning. Participants from schools conveyed a strong impact on student engagement, particularly in the areas of collaboration and often due to the presence of technology. In addition, attendance data showed a significant increase in Lighthouse schools in the number of students meeting the 94% attendance rate. So last year from this year, the attendance rate increased. Teachers saw the technology as providing differentiated learning opportunities and increased student ownership of their own performance. There were concerns expressed by teachers, though, that the presence of technology was oftentimes a distraction to students. Specifically, students were so engaged with their devices when it was time to close the device and work with the teacher. Sometimes the teacher struggled in regaining their attention. So as Steve explained, 21st century skills require more extensive lesson planning on the part of the teacher, and they're not expected to be as common as traditional approaches to instruction, such as lectures. 
Consistent with the temporal logic model, one would expect to see little impact on 21st century skills in initial years of implementation, but a stronger impact the more teachers become more experienced with the STAT initiative. Though there were not significant differences across time points for any of the observation items, there was an increased use of inquiry-based approaches to instruction within classrooms. And there was also increased frequency that learning incorporates authentic or real-world contexts. So observers reported a few instances of 21st century skills in the classrooms, given the early nature of STAT in these schools, particularly phase two elementary and lighthouse middle grade six, the minimal impact on 21st century skills across all groups is not surprising. Principals, though, indicated they felt the STAT initiative had a positive impact on problem solving and critical thinking. There was also a consensus that student technology skills had significantly increased. Teachers indicated on our survey that students improved in their mastery of 21st century learning skills, though they did express during focus groups a concern that the program was improving technology skills but not critical thinking skills. Teachers did agree, though, that integrating technology in the curriculum fostered collaboration, student choice, and accountability. And last, teachers indicated that students need to have a more even balance between time with technology and time with a human to fully develop 21st century learning skills. In terms of the perceptions of STAT, principals, STAT teachers, and classroom teachers were highly positive towards the initiative. Benefits included improvement in teaching practices, the ability to differentiate instruction, development of 21st century learning skills, and the positive impact on student engagement. The three STAT-specific um, climate survey items also indicated that parents and students had very, very positive reactions to STAT. Specifically, um, parents and students, roughly 86%, were in agreement that access to digital content supports customized and personalized learning, and that teachers are able to use technology to meet the needs of all students. So based on our evaluation findings, we offer recommendations for future years of STAT. The first aspect is with professional development. There appears to be a need for increased professional development around the instructional practices that BCPS views as desirable and a lesser focus on technology alone. BCPS may consider focusing the summer professional development, for example, on teacher practices and then allow um, a minimal focus on technology but more gradual as offered by the STAT teacher. A second recommendation involves STAT teacher roles and responsibilities. There's still a concern regarding the roles and responsibilities of STAT teachers, particularly in non-Lighthouse schools. There needs, the, these need to be clearly communicated to classroom teachers, and principals need to monitor STAT teacher commitments to assure they're available to teachers to provide that ongoing support and professional development. In addition, principals need to ensure that the person in this role has a strong instructional background in addition to understanding effective technology integration. STAT teachers should be frequently modeling lessons that reflect STAT goals. A third recommendation involves a technology integration model. Teachers express the need for more professional development on how to effectively integrate technology to su support instructional goals and BCPS may consider models of technology integration that are frequently re referenced in the research literature to support this effort. Last concern, student device use. BCPS needs to establish a system-wide policy that includes consequences for inappropriate use of devices. The district may consider acquiring software to allow teachers to monitor student device use when they're not in view. And last, the district may consider develop training for student device use as students and grades begin implementing SAT, such as basic procedures like how to save a document file organization. So overall, it appears that the STAT teacher is viewed as a valuable resource and critical to the transformation within schools. There was concern expressed by non-Lighthouse teachers regarding the roles and responsibilities of this position. Evaluation findings indicate an impact of professional development on measurable outcomes to various ways and degrees, but perhaps most notable, noticeably on student engagement and teacher practices. Importantly, STAT appears to be viewed positively by all stakeholders, including principals, STAT teachers, classroom teachers, parents, and students. Questions? Right. Thank you. 
All right, Ms. Sorry, Miller. I went a little quick. Okay. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming before us today. I missed you six months ago for the mid-year report, but I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, this is the first time that I've been here as a board member for one of your reports. So I have a few questions just so I understand some basic things. Um, in the beginning, the first paragraph of your report, it describes the purpose of the study. And there are two purposes listed to examine the impact of professional development on outcomes and to examine the perceptions of the STAT program. Mm -hmm. When it says this study, is it referring to just this year or the whole four years of the study? <clears throat> is that, that, you know, regarding <clears throat> that being the Across purpose? Across the four years, we, we're going to be looking at student achievement and student outcomes, so it goes further than that. But where we are now, the main inputs have been professional development and changes in attitude and practices. But moving forward, year four in particular, looking at student achievement in a rigorous way will be very important. So the purpose of the study is referring to really just this year or two um, and not I think, the whole? I think this particular report was uh, focused on all both years because we try as best as we can to kind of document changes over time for all of the logic model components so the purpose could change for next year let's say it could change for next year um, yeah it's not set in stone and and really the purpose is to give you all information so that you could be making decisions so um, actually it's desirable that an evaluation might change with feedback and um, interest in looking at different things and we're open to that i'm glad to hear of that flexibility because i, I was very perplexed as to why the purpose would de be defined in that way um, i mean all along the board has been asking for quantifiable evidence of how the stat program affects student achievement or student learning mm -hmm. um, not how PD, you know, professional development is affecting these various measures that you included in your report, but just quantifiable student achievement is really what we need. Um, now, I see that um, the evaluation model shows that we're not really going to have outcomes in student achievement until we. Will that That's be. Up to you all. <clears throat> um, but if we look at student achievement, given the um, high stakes nature and new nature, and, and you probably are aware of the problems in the online testing versus the pay, there's a lot of problems with those measures. And we heard earlier the rationale for having curriculum based measures that you're doing as a supplement. And that's because initiatives that engage kids more but are more general in terms of what, um, I'm sorry, assessments that are more general in terms of what they measure <laughs> may not show effects. Um, we're glad to look at them. They may show peaks and going up, but they may not show that. Mm -hmm. It's important that we all understand what the um, lack of change or changes mean. But I can tell you the park and the MAP are not likely to be very sensitive to early changes in pedagogy, but it's up to you all. Agreed. Um, but the more we can see, and the earlier, the more we're going to be able to see a trend. So I just wanted to make that point in there. That it, So if it's up to us, it's possible then to get early indicators perhaps six months from now when you give us the next report. Sure. And you actually do have those indicators in a way when every year that you get back the park and the map results, you'll, you're comparing yourself to yourself in the past. The only problem is the assessments have been changing. But you're also comparing yourself to other districts in Maryland who take the same tests and can see whether you're beginning to pull away, staying about the same. But we'd be happy to help you look at that. And, and that really leads me that. to my next question, which was on that mode effect that they've been talking about with regard to the park 
and how students are actually doing better taking it pen and paper rather than on on screens so could you just address that a little bit and how that might impact really even no, the success get that of the program now but um, this is just an opinion it's not surprising to me that an online test would yield lower scores than a paper test because <clears throat> anybody that's ever filled out something online it's not as easy to read it's not <clears throat> not as easy to reflect <clears throat> so being able to page back and forth and go back it probably is a little bit of an advantage but it has to be where everybody's on the same playing field and that was a little messed up last year um and can you describe what phase two is? Is that the control group of kids who have not had the devices yet? So there is no official control group. The phase, so there's Lighthouse, the 10 elementary, and then there's non-Lighthouse. And so the phase two is just a small subset of the non-Lighthouse that are implementing STAT right now. Okay, so that's the year one. Yep. Class phase rooms. two is a year one, and the main distinguishing factor is that they're not lighthouse schools. Okay, and so perhaps a control group, could that be something that could also be added in? The dream of every evaluator and researcher <laughs> is to have a control group, and you know, especially to have a randomized um, situation. But we don't have, we really have apples and oranges, because if you're gonna compare lighthouse schools that were selected in a different way to schools that aren't lighthouse um, you could get very spurious results so we are comparing them based on the measurable outcomes how are they differing in terms of what teachers are doing and naturally we're seeing lighthouse being ahead that's that's totally predictable but if you look at student achievement, are you comparing an apple to an orange? And if the student achievement shows that Lighthouse is better, does that mean the initiative is raising achievement? Or does that mean Lighthouse schools are more gung-ho? We don't want to mislead you, because you as a board have a responsibility you know, of determining what to emphasize, what to pull back on. And the worst thing we can do is give you spurious results. So I don't like using a control group that isn't a control group. But I'd be willing to talk more about that, you know, with you personally or at the curriculum committee or something like that. Um, under the section on P21 skills, uh, it says teachers agreed, and, and I know you read this, teachers agreed that technology integration fostered blah, 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 but indicated students needed to have a more even balance of time with technology and time with a human to develop P21 skills. So obviously there, the teachers are saying there's an imbalance here, but I don't know which way that they're saying the scale is tipping. Are they saying that they need more technology time or they need more time with a human? I think they're more arguing, and from what I read from all of our focus groups and everything, they're more arguing that technology alone isn't the answer for improving elementary skills. It does require both interventions from the teacher and work you know, with the human as well as the device. So it can't be tilted either way. And is there any data on how much time they're spending with the technology? We did we, not collect that We don't that have data. that. Yeah. That might be another thing to consider. However, when we go into classrooms, we don't see just kids on technology. We see normal instruction, you know, where kids are talking to kids. But, you know, I think there's, when you do an initiative like this, and this happens all over the country, I was involved in one of the earliest and most successful te technology infusion programs um, throughout the state of Michigan, Freedom to Learn. And it's overwhelming to teachers at first to have the burden of have teaching regular lessons, addressing the standards, but also learning technology. And I think that what teachers are saying let, now that we're learning the technology and we're getting more skilled at it, let's pull back a little and decide what is the right balance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, these would be interesting discussions for the curriculum committee or whatever forum, but sh being able to share effective lessons between schools and teachers, that's probably the way to push forward these P21 skills. Because not every teacher is going to be able to develop a technology-rich um, inquiry lesson 
every it's a lot of a lot of design okay I appreciate it I, I just want to reiterate I would really like to have those numbers on how much time the kids are spending on the device because it sounds to me like the teachers are saying there needs to be a more even balance of time so it sounds like they're saying there's too much time on the technology and not enough time human time and I'd like to know what there's what uh, that amount of time is currently yeah we won't be able to get the time in a quantifiable way because we don't have the resources to do that there may be a way well, a that survey devices question. can do that survey some, question for the schools yeah, we would can, do it sure mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. right, thank you any other questions at this time from board members uh, 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 I have a comment uh, just a minute uh, Mr. Stewart no, I'm sorry I didn't yeah. see that good good I just all right so I, I said two things so one was can you help me understand what would explain the discrepancy between what teachers felt in terms of their preparation as opposed to what principals believed that they were prepared for you know that's a difficult question because on the one hand you know their survey responses the teacher survey responses said that they felt prepared to implement staff but then once we dug more during the focus groups we heard kind of mixed views I think one one actually changed the evaluation that we discussed very recently was trying to get some feedback right after the summer professional development because at the time that we ask it there's such a long delay right and so your perceptions might change a bit um, and then with respect to actually having this boiled down into an assessment and where we talk about park we talk about map and so forth you know there's an acknowledgement that being able to page back and forth between documents might be able to kind of spur some additional reading comprehension or so forth or analysis you know what does that kind of say about the path we're moving down and you know the balance that we're striking along the way as to you know how do we at least how do we come back to the initial question which is children understanding content well, I, I mean, if the park is administered all by paper, which it won't be, it's too expensive for the state to do, and every state is going to, it's all going to online, or administered all by, compu by computer online, it would still be measuring higher order skills. It's just a little, it's just that the bar is a little higher, it's a little harder for the student to, um, to answer the questions online, but that's the way society is going. Just from a procedural standpoint. From a from an operational standpoint, but maybe that's good practice for the real world. Right. Because how much are we doing paper anymore? Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Yelfelder. Yeah. Thank you. Um, many times I hear criticism of, of the STAT program, and I want to ask always the question: Is have you been in a classroom where the, the kids are using their devices. And if you haven't, I don't think you really can comment. Uh, I don't really need to read this report in, in, in all its complexity. I've been into many different lighthouse schools, and uh, I've talked to teachers, and I've talked to principals. And um, I can see the enthusiasm, and I can see the kids as they are working. And one thing I said last year, and we still haven't measured it, but I know there are numbers out there, is the intrinsic values. The behavior patterns have changed dramatically in, in the Lighthouse schools. And teachers will tell you that. Principals will tell you that. You, you, we can't measure it in terms of student achievement, but certainly I would think that a, a better behaved group uh, will achieve more than one where there are a lot of disruptions. So, I don't know how we're going to put all these little facets and, and, and try and uh, um, quantify and make our decisions by trying to quantify uh, those things that really you can't measure. But I would just suggest to everyone, and I don't know if all my board members have been to sc different schools that are lighthouse schools, but if you haven't been, you are doing yourself a great disservice. Show up, the principal will be happy to take you through the classrooms, observe for yourself ask questions you'll get lots of good answers thank you thank you um miss bratt yes um can i just ask was there any student evaluations of stat present in any of the data like any student feedback that was given that was looked the only student feedback that we were able to analyze was the student responses to the two stat specific climate survey items 
parents received three and students received two. So we have that. And that was only administered to grades four and up. Okay, is there any plans for the future to expand that for future reports? Um, we did originally plan to talk with students. I think it was just a matter of there was a lot of student surveys, a lot of surveys in the schools. So for this year, but we, I mean, we'd be happy to for the next year. Okay. Get more input from students. Seeing where we're at with sure. that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, there aren't any other questions. We thank you very much for the report and especially those areas uh, where we can improve. We'll have to focus on them and work with staff and, and uh, we certainly want to have continuous improvement with our stat effort, but we thank you for your report this evening. Thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> All right, uh, our next section uh, for the meeting tonight is public comment on policies. Uh, we have seven policies um, uh, that we're going to discuss tonight, and um, uh, we have someone signed up for each policy. Um, I guess the first, I'm going to ask Dr. Ferrone. Uh, I see that he's signed up for each policy. Uh, considering our hour, is there you know a way maybe that you can make all your comments uh, on all the policy? You've asked for that before, but I was just trying to think of the most efficient way to uh, go through the policies this evening. So uh, I don't know if you have to do them one at a time or how how you would feel about uh, going through them most efficiently. Good evening to all. Good evening. Um, my recommendation, Mr. Chairman and board members, is for you to make the second reading public comments under the public comments so I don't feel bad speaking to you towards the end of the meeting. The second thing is, as I have done in the past times, I have been using probably a minute and a half on the average at most okay. per one. The third recommendation for you, uh, especially that it's only myself and I believe Marianne Moore, is for uh, for uh, the speaker to speak one after the other rather than okay. alternate. And uh, my promise to you is that I'm not going to keep you too long. Uh, I okay. However, that. I have a little bit of a handicap that I have PDF files, I don't have papers, so it might be a second or two between flipping from one page to the other. All right. So you're going to go through all, all the seven comments, that you, seven policies that you have comment on, correct? Correct. Okay. So the first one is, if you can help me, Mr. Chairman. First one is policy 4100. <coughs> 4100 uh, uh, talks about ethical behavior. <coughs> And uh, very briefly, as I asked the board in previous times, well, before I, I put this thought in, I really truly appreciate the PRC work. And, um, um, you know, my comments are not really criticism, it's, it's really just attempt to add to that. As I asked before, I need a definition of the ethical behavior. And this is really the crux of my comment. Ethics do change as the times change, and one person's ethics is not really another one. So if I imagine myself as an employee of Baltimore County Public School, hopefully one day, uh, and I look at the description of ethical behavior, I really wonder what that means. And that's really my comment about that. Okay, thank you. The next policy would be 4103, uh, conduct child abuse and neglect. Um, this one is, uh, is really similar in nature. Again, I imagine myself an employee there or maybe a student. Um, I really like to know what's the definition of abuse. Um, what's the definition of retaliation? Uh, retaliation is really important for me as a person, as I have suffered in my lifetime from it. Uh, I do hear many teachers that are really truly afraid to talk to the board, especially in public sessions, fearing retaliation. And this is really a surprise to me, knowing that most of us really came to this country because of the First Amendment and 
plus others. So I truly request that the, there would be a definition. The second part of it is about neglecting a child. And when I read about that, I really recall my issue with the school system for the past 20 years when only one non-comar holiday is recognized and another is not. That's a form of neglect, although the policy doesn't talk directly about that. But nonetheless, as a person reading the policy, I wonder why um, we don't really expand the neglect from physical into mental kind of anguish. The third policy, I believe, is 4402. Am I correct, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, that's correct. 4402, standard of behavior. Again, I ask for definition. Um, I have suffered of abuse of a system outside the school system where these words become rubber in shape. Um, so uh, I do really request that the standard of behavior be defined. All right. The next policy is 5440. Correct. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Briefly, again, when I read this policy, I remember that the school system is um, in a way abusing uh, minorities by not really addressing their holidays, even though that the policy is not specific about holidays, but nonetheless, that's what comes to my mind. 6303. Um, about closing the schools at 90 degrees index. Um, I have been out of school for a long time, but from what I know, when it was discussed, I believe it was not 90 degrees, it was 90 index, mm. all right? And the index, from what I know, does not have a unit because it's division between two components. So the clarification I would like to ask about this, are we closing the schools when the temperature reaches 90 degrees, or are we closing the schools when the index is 90? If the correct answer is the index, then the word degree should be removed. Um, next policy is 6306, am correct. I correct? Yes, sir. Um, religion, religion and the school system don't mix. We already know that. So when I read this and the policy basically allows patriotic uh, chants or songs or, uh, you know, whatever, to be included, that's fine, but it does not really allow things that would advertise for a religion or anything of that nature. And in that policy, really, the issue that I raised for the past 20 years about including Muslim holidays equal to the Jewish holidays really comes clearly to my mind. Um, so if you pass this policy, to me, it sounds very much that the school system is going against itself by continuing the status quo. I see the contradiction in that. It is patriotic to treat people equal. And I ask you basically to address that. The last one is 7520. Um, it talks about naming uh, schools uh, according to geography or names. So um, to my mind, yeah, naming a school after a name is a good thing. You know, George Washington, for an example. However, these things do change with time. I request the board to consider an idea to name certain schools by the ideals that we have, not by the names of persons the ideals we have. So one school would be called inclusion school because inclusion is really what the school system always talks about. Another school would be diversity school. Another school would be love because as you know, we teach students and teachers 
So nothing wrong really with that. You know, basically we need as a school system to raise these ideals, um, you know, and not really just be focused on persons. Another school should be honesty and so forth, respect. So that concludes my remarks. And I believe I have, I don't know how many minutes, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I, I do respectfully request that you consider how brief I am. So when I go up more than three minutes, that you would not cut off well, the mic. Well, we certainly appreciate you condensing your comments tonight. That really is helpful for us uh, getting through our meeting. Thank you. <coughs> um, our next speaker is Ms. Moore, and uh, I would ask again whether you would prefer to uh, give your comments separately or together. It's, I know you've signed up for four. Okay, thank you. Dr. Farone, I think I would like to go to Diversity University. Mm -hmm. um, tonight, for Policy 4100, I would like to, now usually what I do when I talk about these policies, I like to connect it with a personal experience so that you can see how your policies impact people. I would like to use an example of one of your top employees, Dr. Dance, who has demonstrated strong work ethic, productivity, and positivity by performing his duties in a professional manner, I think. If he's made a mistake in the past, he's owned up to it in some cases, and also made compromises with community members who have challenged his decision. However, according to an online source, a former employee filed an ethics complaint about the number of speeches Dr. Dance has made, his excessive traveling to multiple conferences nationally, questioning his relationships with tech companies and other em employment contract uh, issues that may inhibit him from effectively doing his job. Now, more than likely, Dr. Dance will have to have a hearing facilitated by the ethics review panel where he's going to be examined regarding this complaint. Uh, which leads me to three questions and concerns. Number one, couldn't the community or board members have had a meeting with Dr. Dance and negotiated a schedule change reducing the amount of conferences or, conferences or speeches for next year um, instead of going through with the complaint? Uh, this ethics complaint can cost legal fees, uh, personal legal fees, and a simple meeting could have resolved this. Maybe suggest suggesting that in place of him attending certain conferences, his, he could elect students or teachers uh, to attend more conferences. Number two, when Dr. Dance is traveling throughout the year, how is he able to pay close attention to the details of very critical aspects of the school system, such as how the budget is truly being used, the enforcement of the equity policy, and Blue Point 2.0 strategic initiatives? Now, see, I can, I can talk and, and give you one perspective and another. And the third one is this. Well, why didn't I get due process when I filed a complaint on December the 1st, 2015 against the 2013-2014 board who allegedly violated their own policies regarding my employment retaliation and the retaliation against my son when he was a BCPS student? Therefore, if Dr. Dance has to attend a hearing regarding his executive decisions, then the ethics review panel should have provided me with equal protection protection of the law so that the board can be held accountable for their alleged unethical decisions violating the superintendent's equity policy along with federal laws I will be speaking thank you all right the uh, next policy is 4103 on child abuse and neglect yes sir did you decide to become an education leader because of the power of love or for the love of power? An example of the love of power is individuals who support institutional racism and bureaucracy, as well as misusing policies in order to carry out personal or political agendas, even if it harms a child's well-being. 
Therefore, my agenda is to ensure that leaders will not misuse or abuse the law to conspire against or neglect children's needs because of their race, social group, religion, gender, or other affiliations, which would be a violation of federal code, Title 16, Section 241. Furthermore, child abuse and neglect could either be subtle through policy segregating children from equal opportunities or blatant enough through violence to reach the headline news. At some point, we have to find urgent solutions to filter out the school system from people who are vicious enough to execute a psychological, social, or physical war with children and their families. So with that said, what kind of imprint do you want to make on people's lives through your policies and procedures? Tonight, I would like to focus on the word ambiguity. Now, ambiguity in policy writing is a common practice. It's basically writing legal contracts or providing data that could have a double meaning, which could be used or communicated in multiple ways for different circumstances or certain audiences. For example, a citizen who reads a policy for the first time may comprehend the legal contract one way, but it could be used for or against them based on a leader's intentions. Now let's connect this political practice to your policy 5140, special permission transfer. This ambiguous word overcrowded. One more time, overcrowded is an institutional racism term that has been used for decades to keep African Americans from having the same privileges as white Americans. For instance, if a school principal decides to arbitrarily dismiss or reject a black child from a predominantly white school, the term overcrowded is a legal code that could be used to cover up discrimination towards students of color. In fact, according to the Brown versus Board of Education case, dismissing or preventing a legally protected child from an academic opportunity is called deliberate segregation, which is unconstitutional. Lastly, during this case, the Board of Ed versus uh, uh, Brown versus Board, Chief Justice Aaron said, Aaron, I'm sorry, Errol Warren stated to separate children from others of similar age and qualification solely because of their race generates a feeling of an inferior inferiority as to the status in the community that may affect their hearts and minds in a way unlikely. Thank you, Ms. Moore. The next policy is 4402, separation from employment. It's important to acknowledge the disparities not only your students face based on their race, gender, or religion, but the inequities related to your staff promotion and demotion decisions. Furthermore, as education leaders, it's vital to treat each employment case fairly with consequences being the same for all employees and not some employees to get away with breaking the superintendent rules because of their social group or position within the organization. So please do not terminate your employees without due process, especially if they are responding to hate, bullying, or other mistreatment that violate labor or civil rights laws. Also consider adding Article 6 Education Article 6-104, Federal Code Title 18, Section 242, Deprivation of Rights Under the Color of Law, Title 18, Code 241, Conspiracy Against Rights, Title 17, Code 872, Extortion by Officers and Employees of the U.S. Furthermore, as a community, we have to acknowledge racism is a mental illness and a social anxiety. Therefore, it should be treated by a health professional. And more people should acknowledge their racial anxieties in order to be provided with immediate help, especially those who work directly with our children. As a result of racism, intimidation, or hate, employees and students feel really uncomfortable and unsafe, impacting both the culture and climate of any organization. So in order to support a quality education or effective organization, I highly recommend more uh, equity officers to enforce the law and support staff to prevent other staff from breaking the law relating to discrimination and retaliation. Therefore, we ha uh, have to uh, be transparent enough to ask us questions, ourselves questions, I'm sorry, about discriminatory behaviors. Do I have low tolerance for um, 
non-white people when it comes to deciding to hire, retire, or fire them? Do I judge or mistreat non-white staff or students or treat students more harshly uh, than white students? Do men leaders treat women as playmates instead of teammates in the workplace? Do I treat politicians differently from low-income citizens and why? When Marion, a black woman, speaks with authority or demands respect, does she anger me? And why am I ang angry? Why do I retaliate against people who tell the truth about my lies as a leader? Do I believe people who live in Baltimore City don't have the right to attend uh, board meetings in the county? And why do you believe this? Do we feel more powerful when we segregate a woman from attending board meetings? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And Ms. Moore, that last policy is being deleted in place of 4103, and we um, heard your comments on 4103. Uh, a policy. This, the 50, one I just read is 4402, is what I just read. And. Um, right. And uh, the last policy for you to speak on was 5440, and that's. Uh, in conjunction with 4103, child abuse and neglect. So you're asking me to do 5440? Well, that's the last one. It. Yeah, and we've and and we've covered, and we're deleting that. Oh, policy. I was requesting that it wouldn't be deleted. That's why I read. Yeah, it's just, it's incorporated in 4103. Okay. The one earlier. Um. Okay, but what I'm, I'm I was just. Even though I still have the opportunity to speak on whether or not it should be deleted or not? You, you may go ahead, I guess. It, 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 yeah. Examples of child neglect could be when a parent is so involved in, this is a personal example, when a parent is so involved in his or her career that the parent may not be mentally, emotionally, or physically available to relate or interact with their child. Or when parents allow their child to be on a device for long periods of time every day as a digital babysitter or not demonstrating patients could be rooted as child abuse. Could an example of child abuse be when a parent purchases so many material items for their children to soothe them psychologically that uh, they have difficulty paying important household bills? Maybe some parents may think if I buy my children what they want, they will like, accept me, or maybe even leave me alone. <laughs> Can you connect these personal examples with teaching or even uh, making fiscal decisions for BCPS students. I believe student policy 5440 regarding child abuse and neglect should remain because it allows the parent or child to advocate for themselves. So this is sort of like a student rights um, issue. So if you're just going to have it listed in personnel for somebody to talk about uh, child abuse, child neglect, then you know what are you going to have put in place when a student want to speak up or the parent want to speak up about a particular case. So that was, you know, the reason why I was requesting that it, it remain. Okay. Well, thank you for condensing your report. Um, thank you for your comments. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. David Green, and he signed up for uh, policy 6306, student prayer and religious literature and attendance. I, I wanted to give a different perspective that I think you may not have heard of before today. My roots are uh, descended from Protestant missionaries. I was raised as Unitarian, raised my kids Jewish. Mm -hmm. I've read the Tao Te Ching very carefully, more than any other scripture, and I'm currently an agnostic. <laughs> Had some nice long conversations with Dr. Farone and Mr. Jamil. Um, two things. One is um, I believe that there is a fundamental inequality related to Muslims. And uh, I think that's due not to this board, but to the board of about 25 years ago. But this m board needs to fix the problems that they created. Because as, as far as I know, it was pushed through without any real documentation or any assessment of, or any description of what the criteria were for treating Muslims differently, particularly from Jews. Um, so that's, that's number one. I think you guys need to listen better than you have to Muslims. Secondly, the other important thing is um, 
speaking as a, as a Yankee wasp, I think that, that we need to pay attention to secular traditions. The history of this country has a couple hundred years of just building our calendars for everything around Christian holidays. Even though I'm an agnostic, I think we need to recognize that and treat, treat secular Christian holidays as a special case separate from Muslims, Jews, and other, any other religions. So as you guys make decisions on this, I think there are several criteria that you need to look at. One is the law. That includes things like separation of church and state, equal treatment, and so forth. Second is practicalities, and that relates to um, how many teachers you have that are Jewish or Muslim or whatever. Um, you need to be polite to people, and it's probably good to um, make, make, um, make it easier for people if you can. Um, so with that in mind, I looked at sections 1E, 3C, 2, and 3, and I, I wanted to apply what I've just told you to how you should um, adjust those policies. In regards to perfect attendance, how I would cut it is I don't, I don't think any, other re any religion should get, basically you should, um, if you want perfect attendance, you should come to school on those days. And whether you're a Muslim or a Jew or any, or any other religion, um, if you're not here on official school days, you shouldn't get perfect attendance. So that covers 1E and 3C. In terms of religious holidays, um, as I've said before, uh, there are two uh, dates for Good Friday um, in this, as defined by the state in their list of religious holidays, which you guys are proposing to use, I think there should be only one Good Friday, and uh, and that should be it. And finally, with um, so, thank you, Mr. Green. Our uh, last speaker on policies this evening is Mr. Glenn Gilhar, and he signed up for policy seventy-five twenty. Uh, opening, uh, occupying, naming, or renaming a school and dedication. Uh, good evening, Chairman McDaniels, uh, distinguished members of the Board of Education. Uh, I know it's late, so I will be brief. Um, I'm coming to you this evening to ask that you uh, support the changes in Policy 7520. My understanding of what the change is asking for is, is to allow more input from the community and stakeholders in the community in the naming of the school. And I think any decision that, that encourages more community input is, is a good thing. Um, I always say that uh, great schools uh, are the foundations of our community and it's community involvement that make great schools great. So I think the two go hand in hand. Um, I had a, uh, my mentor, uh, uh, Ms. Mona Lee Brettall, who's the uh, Park, former Parkville Elementary PTA president, she once told me a story. She says that when, um, Baltimore County Schools built a new high school on Stemmers Run, Run Road uh, near um, Middlesex. Uh, she said that the, initially this was to replace Kenwood High School, which is now Golden Ring uh, Middle School. And she said that initially the, the talk was that they were going to call it Middlesex High School because of where it was physically located. But the people in the community uh, came out and said, no, you know, we want the Kenwood name to continue. And I know there's probably a whole lot of people today who put the name Kenwood into their GPS and say, where's the school at? You know, we can't find it. But for the people who live in the Northeast area, which is where I'm from, uh, you know, the Kenwood High School name, you know, means an awful lot to that community. So uh, it was community input that made Kenwood High School name continue on the new school on Stemmers Run Road, which again is nowhere near Kenwood Avenue. Um, so. I encourage you to, to pass this, uh, this policy change, again, allow for more community input. And uh, just on a quick footnote, though, I did want to say that, uh, I'll come out and say that um, I, I want to thank Dr. Dance uh, for um, submitting a request in for a new term, uh, for committing to our schools for another four years. Um, Dr. Dance doesn't sit in his office and wait for the county executive's budget. Um, he goes ahead and, and goes out and tries to bring our school the resources that it needs to build new schools, to get air conditioning. So, um, so a lot of times when he goes to these different meetings and different, uh, you know, testifying in Washington, testifying in Annapolis, is to bring back the resources for our schools. So anyway, um, I want to compliment Dr. Dance for that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilhar. And um, thank you to all the uh, speakers for this evening and hanging with us uh, into this late hour. We do appreciate um, 
your input to our policies. Uh, I'm going to move on to our next uh, agenda item. Could I yes. make one very brief comment on uh, policy? 6303. Uh, that is to ask that the PRC reconsider um, including in that policy a requirement for daily thermometer readings in non air conditioned classes. All right. Thank you. And I guess you can submit that also. Maybe you already have in writing to them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, at this point, we're going to ask for any um, board committee updates uh, at this time. I guess if Ms. Williams is okay, can you, uh, do you have any comments on? Uh, <laughs> Are you, you know? telling me, like, don't read my comments? No, I'm sorry. Um, no. <clears throat> Go ahead. I, I do. Not at all. Um, I, I want to share that the uh, PRC met on June 20th, and as a result of that meeting, uh, the policies that you received uh, first reader were reviewed and then on July 25th the board approved um, <coughs> PRC's not July 25th yeah June right yes June it's typo uh, approved the committee's report on the school calendar and um, and you all gave me more light and I'm still having issues reading I don't know maybe I do have to get my eyes checked um, I guess the one thing that I, I want to make sure I, I share is that uh, PRC made recommendations regarding um, the school calendar and uh, last year at its retreat and focused on um, the two Muslim holidays, Eid al fitr and Eid al -Adha. Um And we had said that I'm pretty sure we had said at this meeting we were going to be voting on whether or not um, the board wished to expand the previous recommendations to include actual closure of um, schools on the holiday. That's not happening uh, tonight, apparently. Um, and what I guess I'd ask of the board is that whenever we do vote on it, that all board members be present. Um, for that vote. So to the extent that I believe earlier we discussed that at the retreat there will be no votes taken, so that should not be something then that would also be voted on at our retreat. So I'm making that announcement publicly. Um, also to the Remain, extent- excuse me, before you ch uh, switch uh, to another topic. I'm not switching to another topic. You're still, still talking about the holidays? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, uh, lost my train of thought. To the extent that um, <coughs> oh, I completely lost my train of thought. Oh, I know what I want to say. To the extent that. Um, the Eid for this, for, for this school year is on a Sunday. If we don't have the vote in August, I think that's okay if all board members are not here and we can't vote on this in August. Um, and I'm specifically addressing Dr. Farone's point that it be held in August. I'd rather that we have a full board and that it's voted on so no one can say, oh, they didn't have a, a, a right to vote on that issue because it is an important issue. So I'm just sharing that publicly. Um, but to reiterate some of the things that um, PRC did also already do, um, in addition to adding the two Muslim holidays to the school calendar with the notation that no locally mandated testing or field trip should take place on those dates. It also permitted a student who is absent from class to observe his or her religious holiday and opportunity to make up homework, classwork, and any missed assignment, requesting that no locally mandated testing or field trips take place on the two Muslim holidays and prohibiting an absence to observe a religious holiday from negatively um, affecting the recognition of perfect attendance for students and staff. Um, 
I really want to thank the board members for all of their hard work on the many, many policies that come before PRC. And on that note, I want to make sure that the board members are aware that under tab S, under board docs, uh, you were provided a list of the policies uh, to be reviewed for the 2016-2017 school year, as well as um, the policy editing conventions and appeals and hearings handbook. And then lastly, the committee uh, has presented for your information a report of its work for 2015-2016. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, Mr. Yofelder, anything on the audit? The, the audit um, committee has not met since the last four meetings, so I have no report. Our next meeting is next okay. Tuesday. All right. Thank you very much. I, I apologize. I'm sorry. Yeah. We do have a meeting tomorrow morning to discuss the um, heat policy report and recommendations. It's at Newtown High School at 8 a.m. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Thank you. Mr. Gillis, you got a couple committees. I do. Um, the uh, Building and Contracts Committee continues to meet before um, these meetings, and you all know about that. Um, on June 30th, uh, Mrs. Miller and I attended and participated uh, as board representatives in the Superintendent's Steering Committee on Safety and Technology and Data Privacy. Um, there, the administration, uh, administration's work units uh, shared information and updates uh, where they all got together, uh, and the topics included professional development, uh, communications, policy and rules, and updates on that. Uh, the standard data sharing agreement and language for that um, contracts, uh, health and technology issues, and also building long-term commitment. The next meeting is August 17. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Ms. Johnson? Yes, I have. Um, I'll be brief. Um, we, at the last curriculum committee, we had an update, or really, in my opinion, um, an education we, we learned some facts and myths around dyslexia and the students affected by dyslexia. Uh, we were presented a contract tonight that will help identification, um, uh, intervention, enrichment with children with reading difficulty, difficulties, specifically dyslexia. And if you noticed, I've said the word dyslexia multiple times because the advocates and parents for children um, with dyslexia for a long time, we weren't saying the word. So um, hashtag say dyslexia. And I'm proud that uh, Baltimore County has um, taken the steps to um, really uncover the myths and the facts and start talking about children with dyslexia. Um, additionally, um, generally I wouldn't do this, but as co-chair of PRC, I have to echo um, our chairwoman's sentiments that this time last year, um, maybe even longer than that, Senator Collins brought up the need for equity in the Muslim holidays. And PRC was charged with the decision or the, the task to um, update the calendar. And we think we made strides in creating a professional development day. And this uh, vote has just been pushed down the road month after month after month after month. It was supposed to be today. It was supposed to be at the... Uh, the retreat. retreat. Now, then it was supposed to be August, and we were told that it might not be August because we, we could possibly need legal counsel. Right. Well, the bottom line is that we, for the most part, have our decision as, as individual board members. And th let the votes fall where they may. If you need legal counsel, we have Andy. Um, I believe he's full time. We can reach out to him at any time. So um, I suggest our board chair and all those involved that we, we we call this to a vote on August 9th. Okay. Um, we're going to have board comments, and you can make your comments. Uh... I have a question. Oh, OK, go ahead. And it's to you. What's All the right. problem? Why aren't we voting? Tonight? The chairman and the co-chairman have said it's been ready to be voted on. Why haven't we voted? We. What we game have... is being played? Uh, we're not playing a game. Well, we are. We're not playing a game. It, what are we doing? We're going to vote. We, 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 uh, we decided not to, to vote at the retreat, and that's the only decision that we made about not voting. Well, because it was originally have... proposed that we would vote at the retreat. We would discuss it at the retreat. That's what... not true, Chuck. Yes, it is. Well, it, it, no, it's not. But, but I, well, that's I, the first, that's I'll just the first echo what, that's I'll the just first e recommendation. I'll just that echo I what Romaine and, and Marisol said. Uh, 
I agree with both of them. We should vote expeditiously, and we should have a full committee when we vote. We don't need legal advice on anything. When New York City, on, on, as far as this goes, when New York City voted, I read an article in the New York Times that said in the next 20 years, there's going to be eight school days affected by the Muslim holidays because of the fact that they rotate uh, because of, of reasons that I don't know, but it doesn't matter as far as their effect on school. We're talking about eight school days being affected in 20 years. Uh, as far as that issue is concerned, if the New York Times article was correct um, from the research that was done when New York City implemented uh, closure on the Muslim holidays, I do not know. I don't recall from the article, uh, because they did it some time ago, whether they were closing on one of the holidays or both. but. You know, we, you know, I mean, if there ever, ever there's a time that is right for doing the right thing in, in this board and in our country, it's now. So let's be on with it and stop the game playing. And if I'm wrong, I apologize, but it appears clear to me that there's some games be going on. And I've seen games all my whole life, played some of them in my legislative career and other places. But maybe I'm wrong. In any event, let's get on with it. I, and I apologize. We actually, we have a, um, I guess an emergency or a impromptu curriculum committee meeting on August 24th at 5 p.m. to discuss the stat evaluation. So I welcome board uh, questions or comments and I can bring those to the curriculum committee. Um, and I welcome your attendance if, if, if but in your absence, please for, uh, forward me any emails and questions that you have. Thank Where you. Where will it be? It'll be um, in Greenwood. All right. Thank you. Um, our last agenda item is board member comments, and uh, since we've finished up on this side of the room, I'm going to start with Mr. Stewart tonight over there on nothing for no comments. Mr. Miss Eaton. First, I was Miss Miller. Now I'm Mr. Eaton. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't miss That's much. Look at my tag. Yeah. There you go. Okay. It's June. Just call her June. Yeah. I'm really concerned about Ms. Uh, Hazel Jones and her daughter. This issue has been going on for six or more months about her daughter being bullied. I don't know why it's taking so long. Maybe the school is working towards helping Mrs. Jones and her daughter, but I hope that it is solved before the girl goes to school again in August. My next comment is um, a parent noticed me when I was out and about at the movies and she came over and said some kind words and I would just like to thank her for her words because it's nice to hear positive things sometimes. Thank you. June. Miss Williams. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me say anything else tonight. So All right. Talk no, to I'm going to skip tonight. Yes. Okay. Pass on that. Nothing more. Ms. Bratt, anything for tonight? Um, just thank you just to all the board members for being so welcoming, and I'm very excited to continue to hear from the public and from the rest of the board members. Thank you, and welcome again, Mr. Mr. Collins. Good night, everyone. Oh, good night. Sorry, guys, I've got comments. Um, so first, I want to say freedom isn't free for everybody. The cost is higher to some students. And I have some contributors to my comments tonight. Um, from students here in Baltimore County. I'm afraid that one day I'll be shot by cops or my peers for no reason at all, says a student in seventh grade attending Baltimore County Public Schools. I don't feel like my teachers understand me. Not just that, I feel like they don't even try to understand me. I guess I'm not worth it, says a student in 10th grade Baltimore County Public Schools. I'm not a Mexican. That's not a thing, a Mexican. I'm a whole different, I'm from a whole different country. I might have tan skin and dark features and roll my R's, but I'm from Honduras. I'm not a Mexican. Educate yourself, says a 12th grader from Baltimore County Public Schools. I love everyone. They love me maybe because it's, because I'm cute. <laughs> Why aren't we all like that? Why can't we just love each other, says a first grader in Baltimore County Public Schools. So, you know, black lives matter. Additionally, blue lives matter. And here in Baltimore County Public Schools, I believe that we feel that young lives matter. So it's time that we prove that to our students and to ourselves. It's time that we're honest with ourselves 
um, it's time that we respect our teachers and their opinions. And students, it's time that we respect ourselves. Because if not, a year from now, we're going to really wish that we had. That's it. Uh, I hadn't planned on comments, but I, I'm just going to do an off the cuff because I had actually requested to give an update on the um, safety and technology committee um, that we met. And I, I understand that Mr. Gillis gave it already, but I wanted to add a few things into that. Um, I was very encouraged by our first meeting. Um, the committee was very informational for us, the, the two board members that are attending, uh, sitting in with that committee. Um, they were also open to some suggestions that we made. Um, one, of, one suggestion that I was able to bring up um, a concern at the end of the me meeting um, had to do with um, the... Um, no, I can't even remember what it was about for Lee to help me out here. <laughs> um, I brought up a concern regarding the, um, oh, issues surrounding kids taking the devices home. So um, they're listening to our concerns on that. They're even allowing me to bring in a couple of um, IT security experts to talk to them. Um, so this committee process, you know, it's a new thing for us all, and it's uh, very encouraging. And I just wanted to thank them for all of that and, and being very open to us. And we'll see how it goes from here. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Mr. Birch. I'd just like to welcome our new board member. Uh, the word on the street is that uh, she is a debater. Mm. So uh, with uh, having had that in my background, I welcome you here. Uh, who knows where you may go. Uh, you may choose law. You may choose uh, medicine. You may go uh, where Deeksha went to UM. You'll go wherever you think best. Welcome to the board. We want to hear your comments. I enjoyed listening to tonight. And um, I think we've had enough this evening. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. Thank you all, board members, for your comments. Uh, there are some informational items included in the board docs. Um, the revised superintendent's rule, uh, 1270, 4007, financial reports for months ending May 2016, uh, FY 18 capital and operating schedules, policy review schedule, as Ms. Williams mentioned, policy editing conventions, and uh, question and answers on appeal hearing. Uh, again, don't forget to sign the orders. And uh, I wanted to announce the next board meeting is August 9th. 7 p.m. here at Greenwood. That's nothing else. Our meeting's adjourned. Thank you.